Jackson Laboratory's genomic education team welcomes a wide range of learners, from undergraduates to physicians. Our learners engage in online courses, in-person programs, and mentored research experiences. Programs focus on complex genetics, as well as functional, clinical, and translational genomics. Covering basic research to clinical genomics, offerings include bioinformatics, cancer, genomics, and medical genetics. Genomic education is guided by a goal to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion from participant recruitment to culturally competent teaching and inclusive mentorship. Our program is grounded in evidence-based research from science education and adult learning fields. Our programs meet the needs of our diverse learners. Online courses provide real-time access to high-quality scientific and clinical content. For early career scientists, we offer research experiences in world-class research labs. Courses at JAX provide cutting-edge content and foster collaboration with scientists around the world. We develop 21st century leaders in biomedicine through career and leadership development opportunities. What are you looking for? A place to go. A place to grow. A place to explore. A place to be more. A place with a view. That's somewhere new. A connection. A cause. A challenge. Maybe it's a sense of community. A space for unity. A place to belong. A place to be strong. Maybe you're looking for... A starring role. Or a role to watch. A place where your voice matters. We're changing course. Or exploring your passion. Even if it's different than what you imagined. Never means starting over. Maybe it's a new way of seeing yourself. Or someone else. Here, or somewhere you never expected. Maybe you're looking for your spot on the team. Your biggest dream. Or maybe you just need to get started. With a direction. A discipline. A degree. Your best opportunities are here. Where we meet you. Whatever you're looking for. You'll find it at Southern. Expect more. Be more. Southern. Southern. Jackson Laboratory's genomic education team welcomes a wide range of learners, from undergraduates to physicians. Our learners engage in online courses, in-person programs, and mentored research experiences. Programs focus on complex genetics, as well as functional, clinical, and translational genomics. Covering basic research to clinical genomics, offerings include bioinformatics, cancer, genomics, and medical genetics. Genomic education is guided by a goal to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion 
from participant recruitment to culturally competent teaching and inclusive mentorship. Our program is grounded in evidence-based research from science education and adult learning fields. Our programs meet the needs of our diverse learners. Online courses provide real-time access to high-quality scientific and clinical content. For early career scientists, we offer research experiences in world-class research labs. Courses at JAX provide cutting-edge content and foster collaboration with scientists around the world. We develop 21st century leaders in biomedicine through career and leadership development opportunities. What are you looking for? A place to go. A place to grow. A place to explore. A place to be more. A place with a view. That's somewhere new. A connection. A cause. A challenge. Maybe it's a sense of community. A space for unity. A place to belong. A place to be strong. Maybe you're looking for... A starring role. Or a role to watch. A place where your voice matters. We're changing course. Or exploring your passion. Even if it's different than what you imagined never means starting over. Maybe it's a new way of seeing yourself. Or someone else. Here, or somewhere you never expected. Maybe you're looking for your spot on the team. Your biggest dream. Or maybe you just need to get started. With a direction. A discipline. A degree. Your best opportunities are here. Where we meet you. Whatever you're looking for. You'll find it at Southern. Expect more. Be more. Southern. Southern. Jackson Laboratory's genomic education team welcomes a wide range of learners, from undergraduates to physicians. Our learners engage in online courses, in-person programs, and mentored research experiences. Programs focus on complex genetics, as well as functional, clinical, and translational genomics. Covering basic research to clinical genomics, offerings include bioinformatics, cancer, genomics, and medical genetics. Genomic education is guided by a goal to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion from participant recruitment to culturally competent teaching and inclusive mentorship. Our program is grounded in evidence-based research from science education and adult learning fields. Our programs meet the needs of our diverse learners. Online courses provide real-time access to high-quality scientific and clinical content. For early career scientists, we offer research experiences in world-class research labs. Courses at JAX provide cutting-edge content and foster collaboration with scientists around the world. 
We develop 21st century leaders in biomedicine through career and leadership development opportunities. What are you looking for? A place to go. A place to grow. A place to explore. A place to be more. A place with a view. That's somewhere new. A connection. A cause. A challenge. Maybe it's a sense of community. A space for unity. A place to belong. A place to be strong. Maybe you're looking for... A starring role. Or a role to watch. A place where your voice matters. We're changing course. Or exploring your passion, even if it's different than what you imagined. Never means starting over. Maybe it's a new way of seeing yourself. Or someone else. Here, or somewhere you never expected. Maybe you're looking for your spot on the team. Your biggest dream. Or maybe you just need to get started. With a direction. A discipline. A degree. Your best opportunities are here. Where we meet you. Whatever you're looking for. You'll find it at Southern. Expect more. Be more. Southern. Jackson Laboratory's genomic education team welcomes a wide range of learners, from undergraduates to physicians. Our learners engage in online courses, in-person programs, and mentored research experiences. Programs focus on complex genetics, as well as functional, clinical, and translational genomics. Covering basic research to clinical genomics, offerings include bioinformatics, cancer, genomics, and medical genetics. Genomic education is guided by a goal to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion from participant recruitment to culturally competent teaching and inclusive mentorship. Our program is grounded in evidence-based research from science education and adult learning fields. Our programs meet the needs of our diverse learners. Online courses provide real-time access to high-quality scientific and clinical content. For early career scientists, we offer research experiences in world-class research labs. Courses at JAX provide cutting-edge content and foster collaboration with scientists around the world. We develop 21st century leaders in biomedicine through career and leadership development opportunities. Good morning. My name is Christine Broadbridge, and I'm the Executive Director of Research and Innovation at Southern Connecticut State University. I'm joining you from the New Science Building at Southern. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person on our campus very soon. I have the pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 Biopath Jackson Labs Bioscience Careers Forum. The title for this year, 
Connecticut, Shaping the Future of Healthcare, the Role of Innovation in Rapid Technology Development. We have an exciting jam-packed agenda. After these welcome remarks, we have our keynote address followed by two panels. You will learn from our panelists, both junior and senior scientists, about the importance of professional networking. You will then be provided a career development workshop that includes a special opportunity to practice what you have learned by networking with industry professionals. Those completing the workshop practice will be eligible to win one of three VIP tours and networking sessions at the Jackson Labs. Also, a biopath fleece. Stay to the end for this chance to win these prizes. I have just a few housekeeping items to announce. To find more information about our speakers and the schedule for today, please check out the link posted in the chat. We will have our first break at 10.30 a.m. And please post any questions you have for our speakers via the chat, and our moderators will ensure that they are seen by our speakers. If you have any technical issues, please submit via direct chat to anyone with moderator in their Zoom name. Video and microphones for participants will stay off until the networking session at 1210. Please note that this event will be recorded and will be available for viewing at a later date. Now for the main event. We start with our welcoming remarks. First from the president of Connecticut State of Southern Connecticut State University, Dr. Joseph Bertolino. President Joe, as he is affectionately known, is a social justice, a social justice educator for over 25 years and is passionate about student success and access to higher education. President Joe believes deeply in the value of building relationships and has worked tirelessly to strengthen partnerships with the community colleges, the city, and the community. The Jackson Labs Bioscience Career Forum is one such example. President Joe. Thank you, Christine. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the sixth annual Jackson Labs Bioscience Careers Forum. We do hope that in the future, we will be able to come together in person. I do think that that's kind of right around the corner. As you know, um, this year's theme is Connecticut Shaping the Future of Healthcare the role of innovation in rapid technology development. And this theme could not be more appropriate. Healthcare, as you know, is front and center due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the members of our Southern community and our alums have surely been on the front lines there. If we've learned one thing during the past two years, it's that innovation and versatility are critical as we look to revitalize Connecticut's economy. Today's event is made possible thanks to a longstanding and highly productive partnership between Southern, the Jackson Laboratory, and the Connecticut State Colleges and Universities system. For both Southern and indeed the state, we, would no, we could not have a better partner than Jackson Labs. So thank, thank you to Jackson Labs for their ongoing support. Their long-standing commitment to education and advances in biomedical research and you, at colleges, excuse me, and universities across the country are, are sorry, <laughs> this long-standing commitment to education and advances in biomedical research, the work that they are doing are affording opportunities for all, and as I said, it mirrors our social justice mission. And I think it bodes well for the future of bioscience in Connecticut. No institution can sustain the bioscience industry in New Haven or Connecticut single-handedly. Uh, there are some interesting facts that I'd like to share that, that I, I just learned about in the last couple of days. Um, if we add up all the STEM and bioscience graduates from all the colleges and universities across the state. The total would still not meet the projected need to graduates. So Southern's Biopath program, I would say is playing a leadership role in solving this need via the Connecticut Next Funded Biopath Skills Institute. Now, as many as you, of you know, Biopath 
was first established in 2015 as a partnership between Southern and the city of New Haven to address industry identified needs and help develop the Elm City as a major bioscience hub. The expansion of Biopath was made possible by the very successful New Haven Innovation Collaborative. And so as a public university committed to empowering lives through education, building partnerships that benefit the wider community or a key focus of Southern's mission. And that's particularly true when it comes to our home city, New Haven and the surrounding area. Biopath is continually evolving, um, providing academic programs that are workforce responsive, including a bachelor's degree in biotechnology, data science, and chemistry with a biochemistry concentration. And at the graduate level, we're actually offering a professional MS in applied physics and chemistry, which includes a combination of business and science coursework. So while our MS in applied physics is nationally licensed and the only physical science professional degree in New England, we're pretty proud of that. The Office of STEM Innovation and Leadership was established on campus and with active engagement from SCSU STEM faculty, a range of workforce responsibility, responsible programs were developed and implemented. They've just been doing an incredible job. A training program for educators is also offered in partnership with the Jackson Labs and educators can learn to use first rate equipment and then they can loan out to use their in that equipment in their individual classrooms. So thanks to Biopath, Southern students are able to acquire skills through internships, on-job training before they are hired. And as a result, our graduates at Southern are actually highly competitive. Um, through our collaboration with Biopath, there have been 166 total participants in our Skills Institute program, of which 40% are either employed in the local STEM or bioscience industry, while the other 45% are completing their studies in STEM and bioscience. 85% total, that's an impressive number. Our internship and early careers program for Biopath students has also grown tremendously in recent times, supporting the placement of 28 students and recent graduates just last year. And in the first quarter of this year, we placed 12 students. So Biopath has also had, as you know, a longstanding commitment to support students from diverse backgrounds, 39% of the program's participants identify from underrepresented groups. So on May 4th, Biopath will be hosting an in-person event connecting students and professionals of color. So I hope you will be able to join us at that time. In closing, <clears throat> my apologies for my voice and, and uh, my, uh, my, my stumbles there. Allergies. <laughs> Allergies are just out and about these days. Um, the good news is that the spring is here and before we know it, the flowers will be blooming. But in the meantime, I want to thank our event sponsors, uh, the Jackson Laboratory, Biopath and the uh, CSCU system. I, I also want to thank the organizing committee, um, Sarah Wojcicki from Jackson Labs, thank you very much. Uh, Leslie Mara from uh, CSCU, the Connecticut State College University System. And of course, I have to thank our impeccable and wonderful Dr. Christine Broadbridge. Um, as you know, she is amazing, an accomplished scientist in her own right, who's done a wonderful job stewarding our Biopath initiative. So Christine, thank you very, very much for your great work. And thanks to all of you for being here this morning. I hope that the discussions are fruitful, informative, and rewarding. Thanks so much. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you so much, President Joe. Representing the mayor of New Haven, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Michael Piscatelli. Michael serves as the Economic Development Administrator for the City of New Haven, with department head responsibilities for the Economic Development Division. 
Michael has been the guiding force for Biopath from the start. And we would not be here today without his vision, hard work, and dedication. Michael. Well, good. first, let me just say good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to participate in today's event. It, it truly is my honor to be here with President Bertolino, Dr. Broadbridge, Lieutenant Governor Bicewitz, I think we'll stop by, our champions in the state legislature, Senator Cohen, Representative Yaccarino. Thank you all for being a, a voice for bioscience and creating a pathway for homegrown talent to thrive. As you said, on behalf of Mayor Justin Elliker, members of our team who are here today, see Usha Palai on the box, Mike Harris and Ginny Kozlowski will join for some of the panel discussions later. I wanna emphasize that we are on this journey with you. Um, as President Joe said, take stock of the theme, shaping the future of healthcare, the role of innovation, and relate this to your role and personal journey. At the start of the pandemic, we named our journey Together New Haven. And that is much more than just a tagline. We are deeply committed to shared success and a strong economic recovery. So we're in economic development. Our team gets up every day supporting the biotech businesses, the ones that are here, the ones that may look at New Haven to grow and thrive, working with our teachers at New Haven Public Schools, the faculty to have a good understanding of the technical skills that may match up with workforce requirements and trying to make our city more global, a place where people with the passion to help other people really truly result in improved health outcomes all over the world. You will see our progress often in buildings and infrastructure. So we like to build things, right? If you go down by the hospital, you will see the new building under construction called 101 College Street. So I'd might be stuck in traffic or uh, just kind of get a peek at it from over the construction signs. This is a great example, and it's, it's much more than a tall building with labs or offices inside. This, when it opens in 2023, is designed to create a sense of belonging. The project includes funding to support academic pipelines like the Biopath. There will be a classroom in the building for New Haven Public School students, part of our deep commitment to equity. And there will be a public plaza for all of us to go and enjoy events, learn at programs and meet some of the world's very best scientists. Also as part of this project, we will be very soon announcing a scholarship pro program. Uh, it'll be targeted for New Haven residents and timed in a way for the growth that we're seeing here in New Haven. And another way to, to partner with our longstanding relationship with the Biopath, uh, Dr. Christine, some of the other disciplines here at Southern just to make sure that as these jobs come to New Haven, we are designing them and people are ready for homegrown talent. So be sure to stay for the entire program. Some of those people here right now, Sarah from Jackson Labs, Patty from Pfizer, thank you so much for spending some time today with the group. Um, bears repeating that uh, you are not just some of the world's best scientists, you are our neighbors. And we are so proud that you are part of the Connecticut experience part of this journey and just wanted to thank you again for being part of the Together New Haven movement. Thank you very much and enjoy the day. Thank you so much, Mike. It is now with great pleasure that I introduce the co-chairs for the State Bioscience Caucus. State Representative David Yaccarino proudly represents the 87th General Assembly District, which encompasses North Haven. He was, the first, he was first elected to the legislature in 2010 and has visited Southern numerous times to provide words of welcome at similar events. Representative Yaccarito is an active member of the community that generously volunteers his time and expertise. He's a graduate of Gateway Community College where he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. He also serves as co-chair for the Bioscience Caucus of the Connecticut General Assembly. Ladies and gentlemen, Representative David Yaccarino. Good morning, Dr. Broderick. And I apologize to everybody for being late. I'm having computer issues. That's the bad thing. The good thing about Zoom is you could all meet. The bad thing is if you have technical problems, you have, you have issues. But I'm really proud and honored to, to do a small part uh, to try to promote the sciences. In Southern, we do a tremendous job. Dr. Joe Bortolino and, and the whole faculty. Uh, it's just amazing. It's a team effort. But as a legislator, I've always looked at how could I help North Haven and the district, but also the state. And really it's the sciences. 
it's the, the STEM, the jobs, um, the healthcare. You know, with the pandemic, it was science that was helping us getting out, get out of it. But it's a collaborative effort, and I'm just a, I'm proud and honored to be a small part of it. I, I love working with Senator Cohn and our whole bioscience caucus. And our job is to do what we put for the state of Connecticut. But it's really the teachers, the faculty, the, the educators that, that move us forward. And uh, I'm glad to be here today. And I'll continue to do my part uh, as a legislator and as a citizen for uh, the state of Connecticut. So thank you all for seeing my, my Thank you so much, Representative Nacarino. Thank you for your time. Thank you both to you and Senator Cohen. I know it's an extremely busy time for you. But so with that, oh, please go ahead. No, it's just, um, you know, we learn from each other, but I'm, I want to listen to this morning because for us to do a good job, we have to fill, fill the need. But I will say Southern, I've always been very impressed with Southern. Um, your hidden gem in our state uh, provide a lot of education, but also a lot of pathways to, to jobs. And we need that more than ever. So thank you so much. Thank you. It is a great privilege to next introduce Senator Christine Cohen. Senator Cohen represents the 12th Senate District, which includes the towns of Brantford, Durham, Guilford, Killingsworth, Madison, and North Brantford. Among other relevant roles, Senator Cohen is the co-chair of the Bioscience Caucus, and most recently, she created and now chairs the related Coastal Caucus. Both are priorities here at Southern. Senator Cohen has been a longtime supporter of the Biopath Jackson Labs Career Forum, always taking time for her very busy schedule to attend and provide words of welcome. Please join me in welcoming Senator Christine Cohen. Good morning, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Broadbridge, and, and thank you, Dr. Bertolini, for uh, having us here uh, to provide some opening remarks. I'm always thrilled to be back here uh, at another Bioscience Career Forum, not only from the standpoint of a Connecticut legislator wanting to see continued job growth here in our beautiful state, not only from the standpoint of being one of the chairs of the Bioscience Caucus of the legislature, who recognizes the tremendous opportunity in this sector, but as an individual with my own divergent career choices and the realization of the excitement of this stage of your life, all that that brings, the possibilities are truly endless. So I wanna commend all of you for being here today, for showing up to this event, which is sure to be enlightening, but more importantly, you're taking the initial steps as an explorer. No one knows for sure what their paths will bring, where they will lead them, but there is excitement, adventure, and possibility around every corner. The very title of this event, Connecticut Shaping the Future of Healthcare, the Role of Innovation in Rapid Technology Development. I picture it as a sign I've stumbled upon on a path and it's screaming at me to take that route, discover what's ahead keywords like shaping, future, innovation, and rapid development are tantalizing and filled with opportunities for each and every one of you to create the tomorrow you want for yourself and for our state and for our nation. It's no secret that the country is under enormous stress right now. We are hoping with bated breath that we've entered endemic phase of this pandemic we are seeing workforce shortages, college debt on the rise, and uncertainty with respect to our economy. But what we have also seen emerge from these dark days are bio companies stepping up to solve immense problems, develop emerging technologies to splice and understand data, studying wastewater right here, uh, right in New Haven, uh, and realizing it can not only provide early indicators of COVID, but it may help in solving the opioid epidemic as well. So much possibility there. Creating vaccines and boosters, promising antivirals and new treatment options, the list goes on and on, and the career possibilities are truly endless. Today is a tremendous opportunity for each of you to hear from industry leaders about all of the career and educational possibilities in bioscience, biotech, and all the many related fields and business ventures. The partnership between Biopath, the Jackson Labs, 
uh, Southern Connecticut State University and the Connecticut State College and University System is an important one. And by the way, I am a, a Western Connecticut graduate. So uh, this is a tremendous uh, uh, school system that we have here in Connecticut. I know you'll all be listening carefully because as you're walking this path, trying out this adventure, you'll be learning new skills. You'll receive some tools for navigating uh, the job marketing um, developing some new networking skills that will be so useful in your professional development and something that you will carry with you for the rest of your lives. So congratulations uh, to each of you. This is an exciting day for you and I'm thrilled to be here to welcome you and kick it off and can't wait to see the places you'll go. Thank you so much. Excellent, thank you again. Um, thank you, Senator Cohen. Uh, Representative Yaccarino, just for the inspiration that you bring. I know how much hard work you both put in on a daily basis on our behalf. And so, you know, for you to take that time to be here again, thank you. And, and with that, I'm going to get started. Get, we're going to get moving towards our keynote. And I'm going to be introducing Dr. Sarah Wojcicki from um, Jackson Labs. And before I do that, I just want to stress again how much of a team effort this really is putting together this program. And just on a personal level, how, what a pleasure it is for me um, to be working and learning from Dr. Sarah Wojcicki. Uh, so Dr. Wojcicki is the Director of Education at the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine. She earned her BS from the University of Connecticut and her PhD in genetics from Harvard University. Prior to joining Jax, she taught at Southern Connecticut State University. A little bit of a sore point for me, but anyway. Um, and the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wojcicki. Thank you, Christine. And it's, it's so great to be here. I, I've really en so enjoyed this partnership that we've had for so many years now to bring uh, this exciting event to undergraduates across the state of Connecticut. Um, I'm proud to be uh, a Yukon native and uh, Go Huskies. So <laughs> it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce you all today to our keynote speaker for the 2022 Bioscience Careers Forum, Patty Compton. Patty is Vice President for Statistical Programming and Analysis within the Global Product Development Division at Pfizer in nearby Groton, Connecticut. When the organizing committee began planning for today's event, one of our earliest decisions was to emphasize the critical role that the bioscience sector in the state of Connecticut has played in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This led to our decision to make the theme of today's event, shaping the future of healthcare, the role of innovation in rapid technology development, which would give us the opportunity to highlight the success stories that have originated in Connecticut over the past two years. Of course, we can't speak about the COVID-19 success stories in Connecticut without talking about the critical impact that the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine has had on fighting this pandemic. When selecting our featured speaker for today's event, I could not think of anyone better suited than Patty to deliver our keynote. After all, as part of the vaccine development team, Patty helps to analyze the results of tens of thousands of vaccine trials to determine the vaccine safety and effectiveness. You know all of those product inserts with charts and tables that you see in drug packaging describing the health and safety data? It's the work of Patty and her team to pull those off. Over her impressive two decade career in the pharmaceutical industry, Patty's expertise has truly spanned data science, data management, technology development, and globalization. In her current role, she oversees technology and methodologies used to build a sustainable framework for data delivery. These include robotic automation of processes, digital tools, risk-based monitoring methods, and innovative research approaches. Patty has also been responsible for operational expansions in the data field within Asia, including China, India, and Japan. Before launching her career in the pharmaceutical industry, Patty earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Michigan and a Master of Science degree in Experimental Psychology from Eastern Michigan University. I am so thrilled that Patty can be here today to share with us all of her personal experiences and insights into the world of pharmaceuticals, technology, and innovation. In a discussion that we had prior to today's event, Patty shared her passion for mentorship and advocacy 
particular, particularly around the promotion of girls and young women in STEM. So I know that she will have some sage advice to share with all of our undergraduate attendees here today. So without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Patty Compton. Thank you, Sarah, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Christine, for, for including me in today's forum. It, it gives me great pleasure to, to talk about one of the most exciting um, journeys in my career in, in the development of the, the vaccine. And I'm going to share some things. Okay, hopefully you can see something. Looks great, Patty. Um, before I start talking about this, I, I always have to give some disclosures when we when we talk about uh, an asset that that we run. So so I'm not giving you uh, any trade secrets. If you want to understand the financial forecast in the slides, our links you can check. Um, I'm merely going to just talk about the, the journey uh, and the development and what we did to, to really transform uh, and innovate and expedite uh, the, the development of this particular vaccine. Okay, um, let me start with my, my favorite part of my job. I think uh, knowing what's your favorite part of your job is actually what's going to help drive your career and, and drive your, your future interests. Um, I'm, I'm showing actually a, a parking lot. It's in Pawkatuck, Connecticut, not too far from um, where I live. And, and while I'm often in this parking lot because my vet's here, I get pizza from that place, I get my prescriptions from, from Walgreens, it happens to be um, where I was um, about three minutes from my home when I, when I got a phone call on the results of the, the vaccine. As a statistical programmer, we are the first people to unblind the results and know whether uh, a medicine has the appropriate efficacy and if we have something to build from. Rather than drive the, the three minutes home, I immediately pulled over into this lot to, to hear actually what the results were. Um, it's very rewarding to know when it's a go because most times when I get the calls and sometimes it's at two in the morning or three in the morning, it's not so good news. Um, in this case, it was amazing news um, regarding the, the efficacy. The downside of it is um, we can't tell anyone. We sign confidentiality agreements. We as, as statistical programmers were listed on documents. Um, and so we are bound to, to remain silent on this. In fact, we are not allowed to trade or sell stocks uh, at any time during this space until the results are publicly disclosed. Um, it's worth it though. It's worth knowing that you have a, a medicine. It's very uh, rewarding and exciting, the energy that flows when you see how efficacious um, a medicine is. The second um, favorite part of my job, and Sarah uh, alluded to this, is, is actually seeing my work in an insert. Um, this happens to be the vaccine insert. You can actually go to the FDA website if you didn't see it when you, when you got your vaccine or maybe you got another vaccine. Um, you can download it and, and take a look at it. Uh, so you can imagine I'm in, in that parking lot and, and we're going over um, the results. And when you, in, in this table here happens to describe um, what was the efficacy for severe COVID cases. Um, severe COVID cases were defined by our protocol. It means that did you have um, an extra symptom that was uh, severe, like a resp particular respiratory rate, or you had a very low saturation of oxygen. Um, in the severe cases, 
when you saw that the the group of folks on the vaccine, you had you had one who came down with a COVID case versus 21 that were on placebo, you see that the the effect the efficacy rate is 95.3 percent. Um, and when and when you and when you see it according to the definition of the CDC, um, and and here also you will you will start to see uh, threads of information that's so important to to learn and distinguish that according to the definition of the CDC of what a severe COVID case is, the vaccine uh, results we had zero in that case and 31 in the placebo case, which would have indicated 100% efficacy. If you recall, at, at the start of the pandemic, the FDA was hoping for a vaccine that had at least 30 or 40% efficacy rate. To come in with something that had 95% efficacy rate was amazing. Um, I actually cried in that parking lot to see this kind of research happen. The second thing we do is we list out all of the, the safety. This happens to be a, a lot uh, longer set of tables. You've probably seen advertisements where we're, we, we talk about all the um, typical reactions or what we would call adverse events that you might experience. The key thing we're, we're really interested in is how serious are these adverse events? Are there neurologic or, or neuroinflammatory or thrombotic events that, that could happen? And if they did, were they related to the drug? And in this case for, for the vaccine, we saw our typical uh, reactions uh, when you get an injection um, into, into your arm. You see redness, perhaps you saw some fever. These were very typical and mild events and no real seri serious adverse events. Again, this is a, another exciting part of uh, my job to be able to do the analysis and list all of these things out. But what I want to say is um, we're not just programmers that, that work on this space. Just for producing uh, those sets of tables, we, we, we in my own department have lots of STEM majors and, and actually some non-STEM majors. While the majority tend to come from statistics or computer science, or mathematics or the life sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, even botany. We have several that are in the social sciences, psychology, anthropology, sociology, and we have a handful from the humanities, history. Uh, we even have some law folks and folks in women's studies. All of these people tend to, to have an affinity for data. They've been exposed to data. They weren't just the people who you know, in high school loved their graph calculator or could solve the Rubik's Cube in minutes or could mentally use the doomsday algorithm to determine the day of the week uh, of any calendar date. They are people who just understood data, scientific design, and have some capacity for coding. That's who we employ into this type of role. It's in fact in our interest to use a, a wide range of majors um, in, in developing a department. Because you will see each of them brings a, a different set of skill sets, different uh, attention to detail um, to either ensure quality or actually lead us to, to innovation. So I, I shamelessly plug this for my, for my own uh, field to, to consider about this area. I wanted to, to talk a, a little bit about my, my own journey. I think we heard from the introductory folks um, that every journey goes in, in a different space and, and mine is, is no different. I, uh, on the left-hand side are a, a series of jobs that I had during undergraduate and graduate school and on the right side are, are some, some jobs representative once I graduated. Um, my first set of jobs were, were really clerical in nature. In the upper left, I, I worked for the School of Social Work actually uh, running video cameras, videotaping children as part of um, depositions. 
While that was not a particularly joyful job, it's where I began to learn about evidence, fact, law, what was admissible, not admissible, what's regulations, and in the details of timestamps. Um, again, uh, beginning my journey in the data space. The second job I held was in the in a local um, hospital in the pediatric emergency, um, actually as a clerk, because I was willing to work Saturdays and Sundays 3 to 11. And here was my first introduction to medical terms, um, understanding uh, billing codes, and, and really knowing that there are thousands of ways to describe an earache, but really what they want to hear is otitis media. And you, and you begin to understand the, the need to use the same language. The third job I had was working in a medicinal chemistry lab, not as a medicinal chemist, um, but they needed someone as an editor who could uh, type up manuscripts and do some chemical modeling with um, a piece of software. It was really my first introduction to third-party software or, or apps, if you like. And I had a knack for being able to, to draw out certain um, molecules and, and add them into the, the manuscripts for that time. I also had some, some non-scientific type jobs. I, I worked as uh, a waitress in a cafe and here you certainly learn about customer service. You learn about what it looks, what it means to work as a team. And, and you, you actually begin to, to understand the importance of networking. I know the previous uh, speakers mentioned there'd be a networking forum. Let me, let me just state now as an introduction, um, many of us in, in my field are all on LinkedIn. And, and I would invite you to connect with me. We use LinkedIn for, for all of our, our career selections. We constantly look at it, at it for people who have capabilities. And building your LinkedIn network is something I would really ask you to, to think about and, and consider uh, adding me. Um, the fourth, the fourth or, or the fifth space um, is I spent a great deal of time in a, a rat uh, laboratory. I actually did my, my thesis on the effects of morphine within, within the rat um, species, looking at uh, pairing morphine with smell versus space. And while that was very exciting, um, the real fun part for me was drawing up the figures and the graphs and, and learning um, statistical software such as SAS and SPSS. Um, it's where I, I naturally gravitated to and, and understanding that those were my interests are what led me to my, my uh, first set of jobs. Um, graduating with a, a master's in experimental psychology, many expected me to go back to, to the rat laboratories, looking at those sort of things. But I ended up choosing uh, more of a data path. Uh, one of the first positions I had was crunching European political data. Really got to know big data sets, um, got to understand the importance of documenting data sets, did a little bit of, of coding there, but nothing uh, true, truly um, uh, major there. Um, and then from there, I, I ended up jumping to, to a, the pharmaceutical space. And that's where I really developed my passion for data, collecting data, understanding um, relational databases, and now graph databases for that matter. Um, what are the best rules for collecting data? How to do modeling and simulation of data? How to predict data? as well as how to, to analyze the data. And, and so you can, you can see your path can take a myriad of ways. And, and I think understanding what your strengths are, what your favorite part of the jobs are, are part of the key for you to um, continue to, to evolve your career, whether it's something you want to grow laterally, collecting a lot of experiences, or vertically, assuming more and more decision responsibilities. Okay, I want to um, 
uh, with a mindset of strengths, I want to talk about some unique teams that came together um, in shaping the development of, of the COVID vaccine uh, and the role each of these teams played. I, I'm starting with just a, a general um, picture of the, the drug development process. Um, we spend lots of times in the lab looking at different potential um, combinations of medicines. Uh, we choose a few of them to, to uh, move forward and, and look to um, find a way to stabilize that product and, and grow it into a medicine. We then um, do some preclinical work or animal behavior type of work to understand uh, the tolerability and the, the, the safety of what it looks like before we even get to uh, the clinical trials or the human trials. So a great deal of innovation and shaping and transformation takes place in all of these sectors and actually right here um, in Connecticut. I want to start first with um, talking a little bit about the discovery space and, and first talk about an mRNA vaccine and, and what's so different about uh, a, an mRNA vaccine versus um, a conventional vaccine. Um, the, the way it really works is with uh, an mRNA vaccine, um, mRNA code is essentially um, injected into the body, it enters the cells, and it instructs the cell to, to produce the antigens. Um, of course, our, our vaccine is coded um, for the form of a, a SARS spike protein. Um, once this is produced, the cell presents these, these antigens, this foreign protein, uh, to the immune system, which prompts T cell and, and antibody um, B cell type responses. And then eventually these antibodies uh, will bind to, to the S protein receptor on a SARS and neutralize the vi virus, meaning that it's no longer capable of infecting the cell. Um, these helper cells can ha actually help eliminate the virus. Um, and, and because this is an mRNA vaccine, uh, it means it's non-infectious and it really cannot cause the disease. This is a little bit different than a conventional vaccine where it's an actual piece of the virus and, and it's injected into the body. And then in the same way, it, it uh, recognizes that the, the, the antigen is in the, um, in the immune system and it begins to produce antibodies preparing itself for the next time that um, it encounters the, the um, pathogen. The difference, I think, between these two things, uh, what's really fundamental is um, the time that it takes to develop a conventional vaccine is months and months and months. Um, it, it, it means that uh, it's, it's typically um, developed by growing cells that takes a long time. They have to have uh, a unique manufacturing process, um, and then it has to have uh, a specialized shipping process. Whereas an RNA vaccine is really just a blueprint, a computer blueprint, and that takes a day. And, and, and you sequence it, and then you can begin to gen generate your RNA vaccine. And, and from there, the possibilities of um, standardizing or large scale production of the vaccine become far simpler. It's not that um, mRNA vaccines are, are brand new. They actually have been around a very long time, decades. Um, what's, what's really different about seeing it come to, to light right now is that uh, with an mRNA on its own, it injected into, into a, a cell, it deteriorates. Once, um, once there was some discovery of using LNPs, um, lipid nanoparticles to encapsulate it, we begun to su see the value of an mRNA type vaccine. So once we've solved for how can we actually wrap around the mRNA code 
actually get it into the cell without it um, degenerating, we begin to see lots and lots of opportunities. And these opportunities um, uh, were developed by a number of companies. Moderna's one, obviously Pfizer uh, and BioNTech are, are another. And they had developed a few years, even pre-pandemic, and, and those sorts of structures were already in the making. The timing of testing them just became expedited once we, we uh, understood the onset of the pandemic and, and actually what the sequencing of the virus looked like. With that mRNA technology, we can not only potentially solve for or help mitigate this uh, pandemic, it's, it's opportunity to expand just beyond COVID is, is a large field. If you know seasonal flu, sometimes the efficacy rate is quite low. We, we're, sometimes we're too late in the season. We didn't quite get the right viral strain. With, a, with this mRNA platform, you have a lot more opportunity to produce the vaccine quicker, to sequence it faster. And this means that we can potentially do a lot better job of preventing uh, flu in the future. There are other sorts of uh, diseases, RSV, rabies, that this could be explored. It has been explored in HIV and AIDS and continues to be looked at. There's potential for even rare disease. Um, typically rare disease are, are single gene um, diseases. There, there may be an application for uh, mRNA work here. Also in oncology for non-small cell lung cancer, melanoma, all of these opportunities still need to be explored with the mRNA technology. Now that we know kind of how to wrap it, we can understand what the sequencing designs are, look like, what's the formulation, what's the manufacturing. Each of these represent areas of, of, of potentially career futures. Um, number of companies have already launched their trials into this work, and it may be something you'd be interested in exploring. I want to talk a little bit about also shaping the future in the clinical trial space. Um, this, this is an area that sometimes takes years and years, in part because one of the largest rate determining steps in, in clinical trials is recruitment. We need lots and lots of subjects or patients to join our trials, and it's not so easy to, to get the right set of patients um, to commit the time and to join the trial and, and follow the, the requirements um, for each medicine. And what was different about this vaccine is the sheer amount of support um, that um, patients were willing to, to give in supporting this trial, um, what investigators or doctors were willing to, to do to support this trial, what um, healthcare professionals, what a great number of people were willing to do to, to see, is there a chance that we could develop a vaccine? I've never seen anything like it. It takes uh, a long time just to get a trial started, but when you can align all the key people and get them to agree on what the trial is going to look like, and get them to agree what type of patient you're going to enroll, you can see things will go a whole lot faster. Okay, so for us, it really did go fast. Um, Pfizer and BioNTech moved into an agreement um, in mid-March. At that point, um, BioNTech actually already had several molecules ready to be tested. And it was a matter of choosing, okay, which molecule do we want to, to take forward? Um, the animal uh, study work had actually already been completed. So we were starting really from um, a position of significant progress. Um, it was a matter of designing our phase one trial, 
our, our late stage trials, and then collecting the appropriate amount of data that was necessary to, to make a decision, was this vaccine safe and was this vaccine efficacious? Okay, so what you are seeing here um, is a, a look at um, the four uh, constructs that we investigated as part of our phase one trial. We, we looked at an unmodified uh, mRNA uh, choice. We looked at two modified RNA choices, um, all three of these assumed that there would be a, a primary injection as well as a follow-on booster. And then the last concept we looked at was a self-amplifying RNA construct. All four of these were run in our, our phase one trial and we looked at a number of things. Um, obviously the, the safety, the tolerability, um, the dose level, um, the immune response, the immune response as defined by how many um, antibodies were produced. And, and we went with uh, what we call 162B2, the third concept. We could have tested all of them in parallel, but we decided to, uh, in terms of the next phase trial, put all of our collective efforts um, in the P2 mutated full spike protein. And that, um, and so once that decision was made, that's when we applied for um, uh, the the go ahead to go into the later stage trial. Um, what's also different about this trial uh, is it was a very public trial. There, there were lots of questions around the science of the trial. Where did an mRNA um, come from? And a lot of information needed to be cascaded to the public to explain um, where, what the stage of mRNAs were, how long have they been around, what's, what's the science behind it? Secondly, there was concerns that it would be rushed through the trial process. The FDA set out very, very early that at a minimum, we would need two months post-dose safety data, which means that um, we would need safety data for every subject that um, had received at least two doses. And we needed, for it, uh, we needed all that data for at least a median of the population. Our trial had over 40,000 subjects. So it meant for at least 20,000 subjects that we needed two months of safety data in order to draw conclusions that the vaccine was safe. There would be no way to expedite that until we had that set of information. The second piece of information that was clearly laid out is that you needed clear efficacy. It was not sufficient just to show that antibodies were generated. You needed to show that you actually saw that uh, in the placebo arm, you, you, you had the requisite number of people uh, actually um, uh, getting the COVID virus versus the vaccinated group um, not uh, contracting the COVID virus. They wanted full efficacy, not a proxy parameter. So with those things in mind, it was very clear that it would take some time to ensure that we would have 20,000 subjects in our tri trial that had those conditions and a, min and a minimum of 40,000 subjects actually fully enrolled in our trial. So until all those conditions were met, we would not be able to make any real judgments about the, the status of the vaccine. This is our trial design. It's uh, a vaccine trial design is, is fairly simple. Um, if, uh, if, if you want to get to complicated uh, trial designs, you can look at oncology or some of the neuroscience. They become extremely complicated. But for a vaccine, it's usually a fairly healthy population. And, and it's a simple design. The, the subjects were 16 or older. 
It was one-to-one -one placebo controlled. So for every subject that was put on treatment, another was put on placebo. You needed to have uh, a consideration that you were at risk for exposure to, to the COVID uh, virus. Um, and then we needed a generally healthy population, although we did look at folks that had what we would have called stable comorbidities, um, HIV positive subjects, as, as well as those that may have had, uh, may have hepatitis. We also set out some diversity goals to make sure that the population that we looked at was reflective of the infection rates as, as um, calculated by the CDC. Our trials ran in multiple countries, US, Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, Turkey, and Germany. Um, the study design was pretty simple. You give a vaccine on day one, you give uh, the second boost on, on day 21, and then seven days post-dose that vaccine uh, two, you were eligible to capture what we would have called a COVID case. If you had a COVID case any time before that, um, it was deemed that the data were not clear and would be analyzed differently. But if the COVID case came after day 28, um, we captured that case. And of course, we designed a statistical power to understand once we had uh, a certain number of cases, we would be able to unblind the data and understand if it was efficacious. Tracking this data uh, and tracking the number of cases and tracking the safety data um, was a daily task. It's a lot of analysis work. The graph that you see on the right, and I know it's really small, um, it's really attack rates. We were trying to predict where were you more likely to, to get COVID? Was it the US? Was it Brazil? Was it Argentina? Because the, the sooner we had a number of positive cases, the sooner we would be able to unblind for eff efficacy and understand were the number of people on placebo versus the number of pe people on vaccine actually different. Okay, um, to manage this trial, thousands of colleagues and vendor partners were needed. Um, it's an extraordinary set of focus. The majority of each of these colleagues sit in Connecticut um, in, in each of these roles. So for the programming space, um, which is the space I lead, uh, you, you have an entire, in, in this case, we probably had about 100 programmers focused solely on, on this particular asset. That's normally um, not the number we use. It's usually maybe around six or so programmers per trial. But because of the entirely different way we were looking at this, we were authorized to bring on an extraordinary number of programmers. As I said, most folks um, assigned to the Connecticut office, but at this point we were not in the Connecticut office. We were scattered throughout Connecticut, all working on this type of analysis. Each of these areas though, have many, um, many types of roles underneath of them that are dependent upon life science, or, or, or core science majors to help support. They each bring um, unique strengths. Some focus on um, operational aspects of, of a particular um, role. Some focus on medical aspects. Some focus on scientific aspects. Some focus on compliance. Some focus on communication. Um, but each of these areas play uh, a critical role in developing a, any kind of medicine. A medical writer isn't necessarily just someone who majored in, in English and learns how to, to write up um, our experiment. Often they are life science people who had the penchant of writing a good lab report and they could come in and help create the necessary what we call the clinical study report 
um, to share with health authorities. It's an actual requirement um, for, for FDA approval. There's a slightly different report needed for European approval, an even different report needed for Japanese approval, and so on. And so medical writers come from a lot of different fields. Data managers uh, come from also a variety of fields. Data science, um, I heard as, a, as one of your new majors, is, is highly de um, desired in this particular space. New ways to, to, to take a look um, at the data. One, to make sure that there are real no anomalies. You don't want to have someone who enters in uh, a fever at 130 degrees when they probably meant 103 degrees because 130 would be on past um, life. And a data manager knows these things and is able to pick these things out and help uh, ensure that we have the right uh, validity and integrity of data. We must follow compliance. Um, once we, we, we send our, our drugs to the site, they're expected to be maintained at a certain temperature. You have to have a, a history record of that temperature and we have to ensure that it's complied. Those records all need to be checked and verified and understood within certain parameters that the conditions were in fact met. There's a lot of work around clinical supply chain. It takes uh, a whole lot to, to ensure that the right number of needles get sent to say Turkey or to Germany, that the right amount of drug gets sent to, to each country and that it makes its way to every site. All of these fields have specialties that they have to look at, a certain type of data that they have to look at whether it's operational data or actually scientific data, to understand that they are able to make a good decision, that they're able to claim that, the, that our experiment was run the way we said it would be run. And then there are, there are your typical professions, uh, a clinical person who's really looking at the, the medical um, aspects of our data. We want to make sure that there are no safety signals uh, we want to make sure that uh, the impact of, of uh, the drug is, is not causing serious adverse events. But each of these areas could be a potential career path for you. It doesn't mean you have to have a, a specialist degree in regulatory to work in regulatory. It means that you have a real understanding of rules and you understand how our science experiment fits within those rules and that you're pretty good about communicating about it and talking about it. Um, this type of role interacts with the FDA, uh, many divisions within the FDA. And so they have to be good communicators. A study manager works with the investigators. Investigators are, are the doctors you see in your office. They have a lot going on. They're treating patients but we also want them to enter data. That's a lot of work to ask of, a, of an investigator to treat the patient and enter the data. Our study managers make sure that they have the appropriate technology to do that sort of thing. Site management, we're obligated to actually go and visit every single site. We actually have to check that the patients they treated are there and that there's some record of them. Um, that, again, is another set of fields working with sites, working around their schedules to understand uh, what's going on. I want to talk about some of the areas that really did evolve during, during those trials. So while each of those roles were looking for novel ways of doing their business, we're looking of ways uh, of, of understanding how they could do it faster or more effectively. On the data side, we certainly imply, employed a lot of novel technologies. Already, we were looking at e-sourcing. E-sourcing is um, uh, really a, a way of directly capturing basic medical data. Uh, it used to be when you went into your doctor's office, you took the temperature and your, your, your doctor or your nurse wrote it down on a piece of paper and then it would later get 
um, entered into a system, or maybe it stayed in a paper chart. With e-sourcing, now you, you have a machine, it can take your temperature, it can take your pulse or your blood pressure, and it directly goes into your data file. This just really expedites the need for someone to write down the temperature correctly, it's captured straight from the system, it's gone into the right place, and it's immediately available to you. The second thing we used was a lot of e-diaries. Um, once you have a vaccine, we want to track for the, at least the next seven days, what are your symptoms, what are your reactions? Did you have chills? Did you have a fever? And with an e-diary, we're certain that the patient, uh, we, at least we know when the patient entered in the data, um, that it's relatively um, contemporaneous, that they've entered it on the day uh, that it was supposed to be. You'd be surprised with paper diaries how many patients would just fill it out in the parking lot before going into um, uh, the, to, to see the actual doctor. Um, with e-diaries, we're able to capture a whole lot more uh, information. Telemedicine. This is a space that uh, health authorities allowed us to use um, much more with the onset of the, the pandemic. It used to be you had to have a physical visit for every time um, we wanted to capture a symptom or a reaction that you were having. With telemedicine, if you were having a headache, it didn't require you now to go into the doctor's office to say, look, I've had a headache, can you capture it down on paper? With telemedicine, it confirmed what are the conditions of the headache, were there any other side effects that maybe were happening, and it was done remotely. The remote monitoring, the, the health authorities no longer required us to go actually on site to physically look at the computer systems. They allowed for ways for us to digitally connect and ensure that the appropriate audit trails and the appropriate data was entered. We did a lot of investments with uh, machine learning to, to generate a lot of potential data risks. If we saw that there were certain um, symptoms um, or adverse events that were occurring, and we noticed that there were some other um, situations going on, maybe you were taking another type of medicine, we would generate these sort of queries that says, listen, you're taking this other kind of medicine. Do you think what's occurring is due to the, the experimental drug you took or is it actually due to this other drug that you, you have indicated you're taking? So a lot of opportunity to clarify um, the intent of the data and attribute it uh, appropriately. I, I show this, this screen because the other thing that we did is we did a massive amounts of unique types of dashboards. We were so keen on getting every piece of data. So any time that a subject um, was suspected of having a COVID case, we wanted to make sure we got the swab, we wanted it as quickly as possible, and then we wanted it sent to the lab to find out, was it in fact a, a COVID case? We tracked um, hurricanes. People laugh when they see that. It would just tell us what the shipping would look like or maybe we had to slow a particular site, or maybe that meant there would be missing data. The degree of attention of understanding where every single lab shipment was at or every single supply shipment was at so that you understood how soon you could analyze your data was fundamental to how fast this could go. It's, it's um, uh, in, in one fell swoop, we would be able to tell you know, how many patients did Brazil enroll today? How many patients did Turkey enroll today? Are we close to our median number where we can start to track the number of cases? All of this kind of information was critical to knowing what the actual status of our experiment or our trial was. Um, we don't necessarily have these unique dashboards for every trial. We have some, some basic ones, but we understood just how fast we could go, the quality of questions we could ask. And so there's a whole lot more attention to, to developing these types of dashboards. 
Maybe these are the types of questions you like to ask. Maybe these are spaces and little apps that you will, will help contribute to um, in the future. I like, I'd like to talk a, a little bit about the day in the life of, of data. Um, daily, we were looking at uh, the data in a blinded fashion. Um, normally, when um, a doctor sees a patient and is running a trial, it takes about four days for them to enter into the data, into the database, because they've got a lot going on. They usually wait four days and they save it up to do it all at once. And, and then they sit down for an hour or two and they, they plug it in. What was different about this trial, every physician committed to entering the data the same day and they did. That is an extraordinary amount of, of time savings. Even more important, they, they agreed to answer queries. If we had a question about the data they answered, did they really mean this? Is this accurate? Sometimes to get a response to those kinds of questions, it takes a week, two weeks, a month, two months, and sometimes even three months before we get a response to a very small question. The query rates in this particular trial, again, were daily. We knew that our data was clean the minute it was practically entered. So when you have that kind of data available, you're really able to, to understand uh, what your trial's looking at. On a weekly basis, there was something called an unblinded data monitoring committee review. That means some external people uh, not employed by Pfizer, um, who are deemed medical professionals, we would send them our data unblinded. So they knew who was on treatment and who was on placebo. And they would review this data to ensure that we were allowed to continue with the data. If they saw something untoward, um, perhaps, for example, if there was a serious adverse event, say, say there was a high incidence of heart attack um, or myocardial infarction, depending what you call it, the DMC would tell you, stop your trial. You must stop for a cause or stop your trial because um, we're, we're seeing a trend we'd like to ask about. So weekly, they would review our data to make sure that, you know what, your profile looks safe, keep going, keep going. And, and a DMC is applied to across all the trials we run, but they typically meet monthly or quarterly because the recruitment of patients is so slow and the entry of data is so slow. So the amount of data that changes month by month is very small. In this case, the data was changing radically daily. And so having that sort of attention weekly um, is incredibly important. And it just goes to show, again, the commitment of, of our investigators, not just the Pfizer colleagues sitting here, but the, the health professionals at, at each of the hospitals, how willing they were to help support this trial. Okay, once we actually had the right amount of data, and once we knew um, we had the right amount of cases. It, it, I'll, I'll be honest, we didn't know if we would hit the safety figure first or the efficacy figure first. And in fact, we hit the efficacy figure first and the safety maybe, I think it was four, four days after. Then you bundle all that data together. Um, this is just by the numbers, how many outputs we actually had to produce. There were 3000 tables generated during this whole time um, there were, uh, as I said, zero backlog data entry, which is uh, phenomenal. Um, but there were 700 data sets sent. There were a lot of audits. There were a lot of discussions that happened to, to produce um, the results of this trial. But once you have it, you package it up and you submit. Um, normally, uh, you know, you submit and then you wait. Um, sometimes it takes months before you, you, you hear your first query um, or opportunity from a health authority such as the FDA to say, hey, we're looking at your data 
and we have a couple of questions. In this particular case, the, the FDA was, knew the exact second we would have our data. Um, they, they actually would not let us electronically submit it. There was a lot of worry about security attention and they, they sent down um, an FBI armored truck um, to our site to collect our, our database um, and drive it back to, to uh, I think it was Silver Spring, Maryland, where they began to analyze their data. This is about the week before Thanksgiving, and they worked tirelessly through that, that weekend. I can tell you, even myself, the night before Thanksgiving, they had a, a question about um, some HIV subjects that were in the trial, and we all got on a call, about 10 people from the FDA, 10 people from, from, uh, from my group uh, around six o'clock the night before Thanksgiving and ensured that we understood um, uh, why uh, the numbers were the numbers and we could explain uh, how many subjects were, were expected to be in a, in a particular set of analysis. So this kind of attention doesn't always happen. Um, so that's one piece that has to change in, in shaping the trial uh, and the future of healthcare. There are others that are really our new normals. Um, one, I think, is the, the ability to use um, uh, apps to collect data, the ability to use wearables, to do more e-sourcing, to do more e-diaries. This is a space that has, has sort of lagged way behind. And with the advent of COVID, and not just the COVID vaccine trials, other trials needed to employ these methods because they could not go to site. I think we will see um, a whole lot of attention here. If you think about skin, um, some of the skin diseases or skin cancers, a lot of times patients wait before they go in. Now they will have an opportunity to perhaps take a picture of, of a mole they're looking at, send it in and get it quickly evaluated without even really stepping outside their home. Our trials will be in the same vein and I think we'll start to see data roll in a whole lot faster and we'll be able to make decisions on it. The second sort of new normal is platforms in terms of sharing data. Um, in the COVID space, uh, uh, you might imagine that, that companies um, are very secure in terms of uh, what they'll share and not share. In the case of COVID, we did a whole lot more sharing. We all agreed up front that, you know what, if you had less than a 93% oxygenation rate, that meant it was a severe symptom. In the past, it could have been that Moderna would have used 94, Pfizer would have used 93, another company, J&J, &J, would have used 92. It would be hard to interpret the data. There was a whole lot more discussion up front what was in our protocols and what was in our statistical analysis plans that have ever occurred in any type of research paradigm. If we applied those same sorts of tactics to say rare disease, I think we would see a whole lot more um, movement. Um, some for the better, and, and, and again, there still may be failures, but it is better to fail quickly and move on to, to a next opportunity. These I think are the, the lessons that we've learned in the, the COVID vaccine that we expect to continue to, to shape um, uh, the healthcare space. I think the other area that we expect to, to shape is our, our commitment to, to diversity and our transparency around diversity. Um, the, the incidence rate of COVID amongst the African American community was um, much higher for a variety of reasons. And these sorts of transparencies not only need to be discussed, but the, they need to be publicly shared and so that we can address and expand um, the awareness and access, not only of our clinical trials, but, but the actual healthcare treatments themselves. And so once a year, the, the FDA typically publishes um, a diversity report. 
Now we see companies now publishing this sort of thing on their website, or actually I think it's um, Yale New Haven who, who actually generates the good pharma scorecard. How well does uh, the pharmaceutical business do in sharing their information? Um, this is just one opportunity to, to share information. In addition to diversity data, making the data available to, to run other experiments and to help devise other protocols is also important. There are ways to anonymize our data. There are ways to use placebo arm data to advance uh, other programs. And the ability to do that requires some attention to interoperability amongst data, um, characterizing what's acceptable and not acceptable. These are things that must continue to change. The Gates Foundation for COVID put together um, uh, a dashboard of COVID treatment data. The, the platform's called ICODA, I-C-O-D-A. You probably could go online and access it. And you can actually do some analysis of these um, COVID treatments and understand um, what are some of the, the defining features or unique features that will allow you to answer your research question and perhaps generate a new research question. Data sharing is an area that will help transform healthcare. And a whole lot more needs to be done on it. A lot has to be done. Um, with respect to privacy. We, of course, want to make sure we're not violating uh, HIPAA rules or certainly sharing identifying information. So guidelines need to be developed, but also just technical platforms need to be developed and how to share the data and what it takes to share the data. We'll see more of this happening in the future. More machine learning and AI. Um, there, this, this is an area that um, at Pfizer we have, we've put a lot of effort in. Um, some, many things have failed because we haven't digitized our data enough or we didn't feed enough data, uh, but we're getting better at it. And this will continue to grow as we understand real world evidence data, molecular or, or um, uh, bio, biologic data coupled with clinical data. This will allow us to look at um, certain class of drugs in new ways and understand risk detentions. This is a whole emerging field um, in terms of what can be done in terms of finding new um, drug solutions for clarifying uh, symptoms that are out there. I, if I think of just even the senior population, um, it's amazing to me that uh, we don't have uh, the same nomenclature to, to describe some experiences that uh, a, 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 an older population might feel. Having sorts of apps and machine learning to, to help recharacterize them, we can begin to see trends more quickly. We can begin to identify solutions more quickly. This is an area that will radically change um, not only how fast we can um, develop drugs, but how we might uh, even just be able to shape quality of life. The last, uh, one of the last areas that we expect to see massive change is the healthcare review. I'm showing something called a cumulus synergy. This is something that the FDA has bought into uh, the EMA, which is European Health Authorities, and PMDA, PMDA, which is the Japan Health Authorities. They're looking to develop, to develop one platform so that you can see you know, how the FDA reviewed a particular um, uh, drug application. And if they had questions, then other health authorities can see the questions that they've had or so that all health authorities don't have to reanalyze the same data in the same way that they can share their lessons learned. And, and then us um, from the, what we would call the sponsor side or Pfizer side, the pharmaceutical side, we're not answering the same questions three times. We think there's more ways that, that each health authority can still 
um, protect the rights of their citizens, but leverage what other health authorities are, are doing to evaluate the, the safety or effectiveness of a, of a drug. Again, another area that we expect to, to radically grow and, and transform um, the way healthcare occurs. And I, and I want to, to end with, with a, a few thoughts. Um, consider a new STEM journey. Think about maybe um, you want to shape healthcare. There's so much opportunity in Connecticut. There's so many different roles um, besides just standard uh, bench roles. Maybe you already know what your, your strength is um, and, and maybe it's data, maybe it's negotiation. There are so many ways you can play a pivotal role in this space. It's, it's a real glorious time to join um, because each area knows it can transform. And so I, I would just ask, you know, think about um, even pharmaceuticals, even if it was from the health authority side. There's so much here right here in Connecticut. And if you wanted to stay in Connecticut, think about Pfizer, we're here. We offer an intern program um, uh, for, for, for undergrads. And we, uh, I myself, even my own department hire, uh, has an intern to hire program for those that have just graduated. I, please consider them. They're, they're very unique opportunities. They're paid internships as well. Um, and, and they're remote, so you don't necessarily have to drive all the way to Groton, although I, I'd argue for most it's commutable distance. So that's my, my shameless plug to, to think about uh, Pfizer. But if not Pfizer, think about the impact you can have on you know, the early development space using the mRNA platforms, or maybe the clinical trial space. Maybe you're good with even just operational data and you're really good at, you know what, I bet I could help more efficiently uh, get some piece of data from here to, to there or the review of data. We see now one of the things that, that really excited me, um, again, there are a lot of us in Connecticut on the far bottom right are children in Halloween costumes and rarely do I ever see them as scientists and certainly not often with the, the Pfizer logo. Um, and I'm sure it was parents in Connecticut proudly displaying it, but we see the younger generation um, thinking about science in this kind of healthcare way, um, not just traditional roles, but the roles that really can um, bring innovation uh, about. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to even more uh, exponential growth. I think we've seen some transformations. I think there are um, a lot more to, to come. And I, and I would just tell you, um, find out what you're good at, what's your strength. Take the opportunities to, to network and gain exposure. Ask yourself, how can a particular process or method um, be helped? Incremental improvements are good, um, radical disruptive improvements are even better. It's okay to fail. A lot of our medicines don't make it through and we learn from each one of them. And so be comfortable with that. Um, learn to work as a team. None of us, uh, you saw thousands it took to bring this uh, vaccine about. It's because we know how to work as a team and listen to ideas. And there will be so many more ways to, to contribute to the future shape of healthcare, and, and I would just ask you, think about pharmaceuticals, think about drug development, it's a great opportunity. And with that, I will, I will thank you for your, your attention on this fun story. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Patty. That was just Wow, I, ha I have so many questions <laughs> for you. Um, that was just a really an amazing, an amazing story and what an interesting journey that you've had and that the that Pfizer has had in the development of, of this vaccine. So thank you so much for sharing that insight. Um, we do have time, I think, for one question from the audience that came through, um, which I, I, I think was really interesting. So one student asked, um, are there any databases or apps that exist right now that can help to communicate medical terminology across generations or across cultures? 
kind of an interesting concept. Yeah, it is an interesting concept. Um, not that I'm aware of, I, I dare say how many people rely on Google Translate. Um, um, I, I am not aware of any that we use. We, yeah. we, we use a medical dictionary that is managed um, that begins to harmonize terms, but it's very technical and it's, and it's not for your um, uh, day-to-day person uh, who's not in this particular field. It's something we want to understand more. Um, people, we want them to be able to describe their symptoms more clearly. Uh, sometimes they don't even know it's quite a symptom. And, and had they just described it a certain way, we would have known exactly what was, what was going on. And, and this is particularly in some of the neurological domains, but there is a whole lot of, of opportunity. Yeah. For some of the like regulatory reasons, um, they, we don't, we're not allowed to use Google Translate. We, we have to actually send it to professional services to translate certain questionnaires. Um, but boy, if there was an app that was validated that could, that, that could translate questionnaires into five, six languages, um, wouldn't that be easy? An easy way to collect data. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, one more question from a student. You mentioned um, the internship program at Pfizer, and and you know students thinking about opportunities either for the for summer or for after graduation. And you know it's been an incredibly challenging time for undergraduates these past couple of years. You know, spending a lot of time online, not getting a lot of experiential opportunities. Um, so one question, one question that came through was, what are your suggestions for helping to get your foot in the door to try to get some of that experience? Yeah, um, build the network because um, I, I know more about Pfizer's um, uh, um, program, and you know people apply to a certain uh, database, and you you can do some check marks. I'm interested in this area, but if you've made a connection with someone, say on LinkedIn, um, and said, you know what, I applied to your summer program, and I'm really interested in your area, they tend to go look. You know, when they're when they don't they don't have a whole lot of time to look at every resume that's in there. But if the, someone has reached out to them and said, hey, you know, this person seems to have a particularly keen interest in this area they'll pull them by name. And so having that connection um, that helps. Um, again, more and more experiences, looking for those experiences is, is I think half of it, but building a network does help because then you can actually understand uh, what each of those little roles do. And maybe it's one that really matches with your interests. Yeah. But I, I would say build build the network, make the connection, and apply. Please just apply. Get your right. name in there right. in the database to start with. Well, I'm so glad that you mentioned networking because that is, of course, going to be one portion of our program later on. So, um, you know, all of our attendees, I encourage you to stay on to the very end. We will have a session on um, skill building and, and how to build that professional network and how to talk to industry professionals. And then we'll have an opportunity for you all to actually meet with some of these um, industry representatives from organizations and companies in Connecticut. So please stay on. Um, and. And we're going to have an opportunity right after this short break to continue to hear from Patty. Um, at 1040, we're going to reconvene for a great panel discussion. We have um, Patty staying on from Pfizer, and we have three additional uh, company representatives from organizations in, in Connecticut who have had really um, amazing career paths. And so we'll have a great uh, chat moderated by Usha Palai. And so we'll, we're looking forward to that after we take a brief break. Um, and we'll see everybody back here at 1040.
Jackson Laboratory's genomic education team welcomes a wide range of learners, from undergraduates to physicians. Our learners engage in online courses, in-person programs, and mentored research experiences. Programs focus on complex genetics, as well as functional, clinical, and translational genomics. Covering basic research to clinical genomics, offerings include bioinformatics, cancer, genomics, and medical genetics. Genomic education is guided by a goal to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion from participant recruitment to culturally competent teaching and inclusive mentorship. Our program is grounded in evidence-based research from science education and adult learning fields. Our programs meet the needs of our diverse learners. Online courses provide real-time access to high-quality scientific and clinical content. For early career scientists, we offer research experiences in world-class research labs. Courses at JAX provide cutting-edge content and foster collaboration with scientists around the world. We develop 21st century leaders in biomedicine through career and leadership development opportunities. What are you looking for? A place to go. A place to grow. A place to explore. A place to be more. A place with a view. That's somewhere new. A connection. A cause. A challenge. Maybe it's a sense of community. A space for unity. A place to belong. A place to be strong. Maybe you're looking for... A starring role. Or a role to watch. A place where your voice matters. We're changing course. Or exploring your passion, even if it's different than what you imagined. Never means starting over. Maybe it's a new way of seeing yourself. Or someone else. Here, or somewhere you never expected. Maybe you're looking for your spot on the team. Your biggest dream. Or maybe you just need to get started. With a direction. A discipline. A degree. Your best opportunities are here, where we meet you. Whatever you're looking for. You'll find it at Southern. Expect more. Be more. Southern. Excellent. Welcome back. We're now returning to our main program. And with that, we're starting with our first panel of the day. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Usha Pillai, who is the founder and president of Area Management Consulting, LLC. She spe there she spe specializes in strategy, critical thinking, change management, and project program management. She leverages her broad scientific knowledge, business skills, and networking, to find solutions for challenging problems. She's actively involved in various boards and serves as the biostrategist for EDC New Haven. And on a personal level, Usha is a wonderful colleague and mentor who has been instrumental in the implementation of BioTap Path for the start. 
You are now in for a treat. Dr. Pillai, I hand things to you. Thank you so much, Christine. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, good morning, everyone. I have to start by saying what an incredible presentation uh, packed with information and insights from our keynote speaker, who's also on our panel. Patty, thank you so much for sharing insights on what it takes to shepherd a drug to market, uh, giving us a glimpse into the development of mRNA COVID vaccine and how technology plays a role in, in drug development and for highlighting all the different types of talent and jobs that work together to make this a reality. You also provided some tangible ideas of the types of roles our students could aspire and regardless of whether it is directly connected to STEM or not. So thank you for that. Let's continue our learning this time from our panelists. Uh, let me begin by extending a warm welcome to all of our panelists. Why don't we go around the room and have each of you introduce yourselves, where you work and what you do. So let's, let's start with you, Shira. Thank you, Usha, and good morning, everyone. My name is Shira Lanskroner Ager. I'm a PhD scientist by training, and I've been working in industry for the last eight years. I'm currently an associate director at the External Innovation Group at Ipsen Pharmaceuticals, based in uh, Boston. Um, my key role is, uh, is scouting and evaluating new opportunities for partnerships within the rare disease space. Thank you. Let's let's go to you, Patty. Hi, uh, everyone. If you've just joined, I'm Patty Compton, and I lead the statistical programming and analysis group at Pfizer um, here here in Connecticut, Groton, Connecticut. Um, and I have been in the um, data industry for the past 25 years, but over 20 years uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Mark, you're next on my panel, so why don't we go with you? All right, good morning, everyone. I'm a professor at the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut. Uh, JAX is a nonprofit biomedical research institute. Uh, here, I lead the R&D activities for our CLIA Diagnostic Laboratory, clinical diagnostic lab that has done a lot of COVID testing in the state, but also has uh, wide programs in the area of oncology and tumor profiling. Uh, my background is in genomics, and I've worked for uh, a long time in a lot of different contexts in that area, including um, back in the day at Solera Genomics, which was the company that was involved in the Human Genome Project. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Yashoda, last but not least. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. My name is Yashoda Sharma. I am a program director at the Digital Medicine Society. Um, my background is uh, academic research with a focus on managing large genetics and genomics programs. Um, and at the Digital Medicine Society, working with uh, all sectors of healthcare to develop best practices for implementing digital health technologies for digital medicine. Wonderful. J just the diversity of uh, experiences in our panel. I think our, our students are in for, a, in for a treat. So great. Um, I also want to let you know as panelists and uh, audience that many of our students submitted questions in advance. So thank you for that. That's fantastic. And as you listen to the panel, if you do have questions, please put them into the chat room. We will try to get to them uh, as, as much as possible. So let's let's get started with the with the panel. Um, Yashoda, I'm going to start with you. So these days we we hear the word innovation pretty much thrown around everywhere. Uh, what does that mean for you in the world of technology development? And what new technologies are being anticipated, and how will it change the outlook of biotech jobs? And then one additional component, if you could address in it, is will this increase or decrease hiring? Great. Um, so I know when we think of, of innovation, we automatically go to new products or new ideas. Um, but I want to challenge us to think a little bit deeper about that. For those ideas or products to be most useful, we have to think deeper and more globally. And by that, I mean we have to look to areas where we have deficits. And so we see a lot of deficits in biomedical research and healthcare. 
And we've seen the grave consequences with the pandemic that, that have resulted from decades long health disparities. Um, because research and in healthcare have historically only focused on small segments of the population. And we've seen the limitations in our capabilities to cure diseases or improve treatments because of only focusing on small populations. And to have impactful and lasting innovation, we need to make sure that all groups are, are represented and able to fully participate. So this means all races and ethnicities, all ages, all sexual orientation, gender identities, socioeconomic status, physical and cognitive abilities as well. Um, so innovation means developing an inclusive and equitable ecosystem so we can have more diverse clinical research teams to then conduct better research that will give us richer data that ultimately will have a, a, a more impactful, um, create more impactful measures for healthcare and, and more effective outcomes. And digital health technologies and digital medicines are exploding with new innovation and new jobs that allow us to not only focus on one area, not just focusing on one biology or chemistry, but being able to bridge that across sectors with, with business, with the arts. And I think that's where the future of innovation is. And that's where we're, we are gonna find a lot of opportunities for, for new jobs and to be creative and, and coming up with different ways of, of solving these problems. Oh, thank you. So you're talking about it becoming a science and an art blend here. Exactly, exactly. And this expands the, it, it really expands the opportunities for everyone to participate um, and be innovative and bring those fresh and different ideas that we don't historically think about when we, we think about innovation or even when we think about innovation in, in STEM. Okay, great. Uh, Mark, do you do you want to uh, elaborate a little bit uh, on the same topic, given JAX has been in the innovative uh, front front center for a long time? Sure. So what, one of my favorite quotes is uh, from Albert Einstein, which was just, I was just thinking about this when we were thinking, talking about this innovation section is, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research, would it? And I feel like that a lot because in, the, in, in genomic technology in particular, but in a lot of areas of technology development, so much of it is new that it can feel overwhelming for people who have been in this field for a long time, let alone for people who are trying to get into it. And so I, what, the first thing I wanna say is to, uh, for folks who are embarking on this path, don't be intimidated by what you don't know. Uh, that is a common feature of science is trying to understand and learn. Um, but having said that, the, the genomic technologies in particular and lots of aspects of technologies really are changing rapidly. And it's an opportunity, I think, to, uh, to, to, to think about problems in new ways. So Illumina sequencing has been around for 20 years. It's still the dominant form of doing genomics these days. And yet the, the ways that Illumina sequencing is being used continue to evolve and, and change and th there are new opportunities there. And um, you know, I think from a, a, a getting started perspective, there are a lot of ways to build on that foundation of um, you know, what's been published, what's known, but also thinking about new ideas and new strategies. So um, I, I'll, I'll pause at that moment and say, and, and another question, Usha, you were interested in addressing is, is this really gonna, is this complexity of technology gonna increase the opportunities or decrease? Mm -hmm. I actually think it's gonna increase um, you know, on the one hand, there's still a lot that's that really relies on on hands, on good hands to to do work and and get things done. Um, but there's also a lot of opportunities around data analysis and conceptualization that uh, really depend on um, thinking carefully about a problem and potential solutions. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. But there are a lot of different ways to approach uh, entry level in these in these kinds of jobs based on. Um, uh, a little bit of experience. Yeah, that's uh, that's very helpful. And and I was as you were saying this, I was thinking about the automation that's coming into the field, which is also another form of innovation. Uh, yes. None of that will still take away from uh, actual hands-on human brain working on all of these. Uh, so thank you, uh, Shira and Patty. Do you have any anything to add to this? 
I wanted to add that innovation um, is also a mindset, you know, bringing innovation to technology. And it can be represented not only by the end product of a brand new product, but really about innovation within the process. And that can be relating to accelerating um, accelerating a process, right? Cutting something that takes a year, but all of a sudden finding an innovative way to cut it from one year to six months, whether it's because it's a different animal model that you bring in or just a different uh, way of thinking to really allow for decision-making. It can be from a financial perspective that you bring how you can cut the cost of it STEM related problem. So I, I just want to make sure that people understand that that innovation in STEM is still a very cross pollinated area where the innovation can come from different areas uh, as well. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Shira. Patty? Yeah, I was just going to, to echo a few things. One, I, I think it will increase hiring. I think there is, um, I think as Shira had said and Yashoda had said, there's a whole lot of populations and landscapes to cover. It's a culture, it's a mindset. And so whatever process you're executing, you have to keep thinking, gosh, could I do it differently? Can I cut out some red tape? What would it really take um, to, to make this simpler or, or easier? And you know, if you were given all the resources and all the money in the world and all the technology, what would this process actually look like? And then working backwards, what would it take to get there? I think that mindset is what a lot of companies in the biotech space are interested in, and they and they want attention to pay, be paid to that. And I think it's going to just increase hiring in these areas. Yeah, and and I think the young folks coming in with fresh eyes are going to be the ones to notice and pick up those things. So yes, absolutely. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you uh, for talking about that. And, you know, that kind of takes me to um, the part that when when we think about technology, um, our, our students today are so much better at using technology than we were at their age. Um, so can you talk about programming and analysis and com computational skills that are required in lab work? And what are some of the biomedical engineering pathways uh, that, that folks could consider? As much as we talk about that uh, hardcore function, I also would like you to touch on uh, what's the importance of soft skills. Um, so Patty, uh, let's start with you there on this topic. Yeah. Um, I, I'll say a, a, a couple of things. Um, I, I do think students are much better at using technology, which is, which is why about two, three, maybe four years ago, we, we started doing the intern to hire program um, at, at Pfizer because of the skill sets that they could infuse so readily into, into the Pfizer culture. Some of the technology that they know are the technical spaces. So in, in my area, um, a lot of us do statistical analysis using SAS. Open source code from R ha has been long in development. A lot of uh, students learn it. We're looking for ways to get that acceptable at health authorities. It's a faster way to make a graphical uh, a depiction of data using R. We know it's faster in figures. You can actually analyze bigger data sets in, in that sort of language. So we know students know that better. They can write little R shiny apps to, to look at very specific uh, problems. And, and we know they're very quick at it. So we. We know that element of technology. They know other languages, Julia, Python, and and they and, and how to code. But they also bring um, a unique communication set of skills. They've grown up with uh, social media. They've grown up with not necessarily uh, email. I, I hate email. I actually don't think it advances much at all other than documentation. Um, and so they know how to work in a virtual community. And, and post-pandemic, we are a virtual community. And they know how to, I think, share ideas faster. 
And so I, I think that's heading towards um, some of the, the, the soft skills. They, they know when to respond, not when to respond. Um, they know how to get a, an idea across fairly quickly. Um, they certainly bring a lot of joy and amusement. Um, I, they, they're, they're experts at the, the cunning gift to, to add to, uh, to make a, a, a point. But these sorts of communication skills and their, their ability um, to work around technology and want new technology. For example, the student who asked the question, hey, is there an app? I can already see that students like, well, how, how, what would it take to build this app? Who would I need to get involved? They're already asking the right types of questions because they don't have the patience to do it the long way or unwilling to to, to, to do it these um, methodical, or I, I, would, I would call it um, not as efficient ways. They want to see if there's a, a, an appropriate new technology that could put, be put in place. But I think for computational spaces, using some of the open source codes are something that um, every industry is looking to understand how can we validate and make more of it. Yeah, that's so true. And um, so many of those things, I'm sure the students in the audience were nodding their heads saying in violent agreement with you. Uh, Shira, your thoughts? I think where there's a uh, gap that the, the new general, you know, new, new uh, people can bring in is the distilling all these massive data sets that are being generated, whether it's through uh, transcriptomics, uh, multi-omics, um, real world, real world, real world, world data, uh, clinical data, and distilling this uh, information into really uh, viable uh, go no go decisions, right? Because at the end of the day, the industry moves. That's the lingo, right? We want go no go decisions, and so having the ability to um, to distill that massive amount of information, uh, communicating it, learning how to deal with. Uh, with these uh, data sets is, is going to be really instrumental. And this is also uh, relevant for the biomedical engineering uh, pathways, because I think a lot of the, there are different platforms in the biomedical engineering that are working to develop, again, large data sets. So for example, spatial transcriptomics, spatial proteomics, that requires an engineer to construct a, a tool but then the data that's generated from these massive amounts of analysis requires uh, distilling. And so um, in terms of the uh, other biomedical engineering uh, opportunities, uh, there's a lot of increase in tissue engineering approaches. How do you, can you engineer hearts? How can you 3D organoids? Uh, some, some students may have heard of growing uh, within a tissue culture and, and mimicking not only a one cell type, but really a whole different cell types uh, together within a microenvironment. So I'm kind of drifting now to the biomedical engineers uh, opportunities, um, drug delivery and biomedical imaging. These are all opportunities for biomedical engineering to, uh, to tap into um, analysis of large data sets, but also to contribute to the uh, pharmaceutical and uh, industry. Thank you. So, so one of the areas that uh, part of the question, and I know it was a much bigger question, was also about the soft skills and the importance of soft skills. So, um, Mark and Yeshua, that do you would you like to chime in on the value of uh, soft skills along with um, this this uh, discipline specialty and discipline expertise? So, I think for um, to pick up on a point that Shira mentioned about large data sets. Uh, there's there's a ton of unanalyzed data sitting around out there, and it's it can be very difficult to dive in and find an interesting question to address with that. But uh, suffi suffice it to say, there from a data analysis perspective, there are just tremendous opportunities, generally speaking, in in, in any organization for asking more deep questions that have already been asked about given data sets, at least on the research side. And I think. Uh, one of the core elements of that is trying to understand the history, the limitations, the constraints, the metadata associated with that. And that's really a collaborative process of understanding why the data exists, what its 
uh, opportunities and constraints are and how to go about uh, you know, what, what are the questions to ask with that, whether it's a new data set or an existing data set. It's this collaboration around um, um, un understanding what you have to work with that I think is an opportunity and really in encourages asking questions, uh, getting to know the people that you work with and, and how to take best advantage of any given situation. Yeah, wonderful. Um, Yashoda, anything to add from your, your standpoint? Yeah, I mean, just more directly on on soft skills, they're going to be so important. We have the technical, we have we'll have the people who are very technical, but we need the people who can communicate across those different um, specialties. We'll need the people who can manage uh, the different projects or or different peoples and, and bringing bringing everyone together. So I think soft skills definitely have a really big role to play um, in, in all of this, and and definitely with. Um, making technology more widely applicable to different fields in different settings, as well as to, to different people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I think, um, you know, just to kind of cap on that uh, soft skills, um, the, the good that the technology brings also brings a downside to it because you're comfortable being behind a screen and uh, may, not, may not think as much about those soft skills of interpersonal relationship. Uh, Yashoda, you mentioned communication. And as Mark indicated, collaboration is a critical component for this to be successful. And you heard both Patty uh, in her uh, presentation, as well as Sheila talking about all the different disciplines that need to come in. So having a good listening skills in addition to being a good communicator becomes so, so very important. And as we, as we go further into our conversation with the panel, we'll be talking about how do you get hired, right? So having that interpersonal relationship and ability to to project who you are, but also be empathetic to being a good listener becomes an absolutely important element in all of this. So, so let's let's uh, that takes me to the um, next question for for you, and uh, maybe this time, uh, Yashoda, since you've wrapped up, let's start with you. And on this question is, uh, when hiring talent coming out of college, uh, what do you look for besides their formal education? And um, in terms of internship, because we, we did hear from Patty during her presentation how important internship is, uh, wh what's your perspective on the importance of it? Uh, but I, I want to put a nuance to it. When you think about you know, your average student, um, not everyone has stellar GPA. So if you do not have stellar GPA, how do you gain access to an internship um, and then uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. I'll come back. There are a couple more questions that I want to ask as a follow on to it. So let's let's start with that. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so so just generally, um, I've had quite a bit of experience over the past 15 years um, hiring fresh graduates um, for academic research programs. Um, and the one thing that I think is the most important is is mindset. Uh, I look for someone who is eager to learn and apply new skills. So formal education and grades are important, um, but they don't give you the full picture of a person's capabilities. But someone who's excited to learn, regardless of what job they, you're hiring them for, they will work hard and they will wanna make sure that their work is impactful. And so that's what's most important for me. Um, and if you don't have good grades, that doesn't mean <laughs> you can't pursue something that you're interested in. I think there are um, there are internships that might be more more based on grades, but there's also other opportunities uh, with volunteering, for example. Um, it's a little different now with the pandemic and th things being on lockdown and not being able to interact so much fully in person. But academic researchers could always use more more hands to help in their work. And if you call, if you look someone up on LinkedIn or you go to their profile on uh, their institution and you look up the work they're doing and it's something that's interesting to you, reach out to them. And Patty mentioned this earlier, reach out to them, try to make a connection, offer to, to volunteer. You'll, you'll learn some new skills. You'll learn a little bit more about your strengths and what you can do. And, and they'll get some free labor, which they'll definitely appreciate. And so, in the absence of being able to get a competitive internship, you will you can still get 
some some nice experience that you can then build on um, it, it, for the rest of your career. And you can then use that to apply to specific jobs or graduate school or other things. And then for soft skills, you can get those volunteering or working in, in any, any environment. Um, so definitely try to find a balance of, of building those up and don't focus so much. Grades are important, you need to graduate. Um, but if you've had a bad semester or something just didn't click for you, don't give up. There's other opportunities for you to, to develop the skills that will then lead you to the rest of your career. So I'm going to stay with you for a moment before I go to Patty with the same question. So um, Patty talked about uh, uh, opportunities that are beyond STEM. Are there are there internship opportunities beyond STEM, um, as well as job opportunities in the in the STEM area, even if you're not a STEM STEM student? And second part of it, how do you support your new hires at at, at your um, company? What, what kind of things do you do to make sure they are integrated and successful? So I think um, definitely there there are opportunities if, if your focus has not been been STEM. Um, I really want to emphasize that kind of mindset, the growth mindset of wanting, being excited about something and wanting to learn. I think that goes a long way. Um, in terms of supporting people, we, we do a lot of tr trying to identify strengths um, and helping people to develop the things that are important to them for whatever position they've been hired into or, or they're working on but then also try to help them develop new skills that they would like to acquire for a, a, a future perspective. And so it really is um, providing the training and the support to do the job currently, but then also providing that extra level of support um, and skill development and building to get to the next level. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Patty, I wanna to go to you uh, because you did speak about this in your presentation and touched on it. So would you care to elaborate for those who may not have um, had the benefit of hearing you before? Yeah, so when I'm looking at uh, talents of, of coming out of, uh, out of the, straight out of college or university, I, I'm looking for um, what are their interests um, why, why do they want to work in our field? So just to understand their level of understanding and level of engagement, I think you should have talked about just showing a, a passion for the, the particular area. Some of the other skills, you know, we, we try to assess some of the soft skills right there. Are they, you know, do they negotiate? Are they, are they uh, attentive to um, verbal and nonverbal cues? Um, because we work in this this sort of virtual space, will they work, be able to contribute to um, a team environment? Even in my own intern to hire program, the first it's ten weeks. Um, the first five weeks are some training, some some lectures, some individual uh, skill sets. The last five weeks, they're divided into teams and they work on a, a project together and there's some presentation at the end and then they're individually interviewed. It's because we're such a matrix organization. We want to know, can they communicate? Can they work uh, with others who have other expertise and, and then voice the expertise that we need them to, to voice? I think the other skill that we look for is project management. If you, if you remember the presentation, there were a ton of roles that, that contributed to the development of the drug. In the exact center is the project manager. They're the Uber who really understands um, how pieces get, get shuffled around. So if you have uh, some, some exposure to project management, it will, it will help you uh, be able to characterize your own work any dependencies um, uh, or interdependencies uh, on other people's work to to deliver whatever it is you're you're interested um, in delivering. With respect to the the GPA question, I, I find that interesting um, because I know Pfizer's own program has uh, for the undergrad has a minimum um, GPA space. It's funny though in our hiring practice. I don't know that we look at GPAs. 
Mm -hmm. um, I, I would focus on the the classes, hopefully that you did well in, which hopefully are are more central to to what you want to uh, explore in in your career. And and again, I would network. Honestly, if if someone came applied to my internship program and somehow got screened out but were linked to me and said, hey, this was a bad semester because, you know, whatever reason, I'm sure is legitimate. Sometimes there, there's another opportunity, uh, you know, as Yoshoda said, there's a volunteer opportunity or maybe a separate project that runs a little bit different. It's just a different opportunity that they can take advantage of because they asked. I, I think, ev you know, everyone, I certainly wasn't uh, a straight A student and and, you know, had an area that you know wasn't so well, and the, the first thing my advisor said was, probably you shouldn't pursue that area. Best advice I ever received. Yeah, you know why would I pursue, you know this this particular humanity area, when I clearly am so much more excited about this area and have a better aptitude for for that. So I think you know we all acknowledge that um, perfection is actually not what we're after. We're, we're after diversity. We're after um, contribution and, and, and teamwork type um, behaviors. We do expect a certain set of expertise, but I think focus on that. Explain your story if, if you really feel it needs um, explaining. I'm sure there are unique opportunities that are out there to support your, your career. Thank you, Patty. Um, just just a quick um, story. My niece was looking for uh, an internship, and um, first year most uh, most uh, students don't do really well because they have other distractions. Being first year uh, college students, but the CEO, uh, when I talked to him about her, I said to him, "Just pause for a moment. Remember your first year in college." And to his credit, he goes, "Oh yeah, I do. Okay, yeah, let's look at her resume." So. So I think the network part is just so so important. Uh, Shira and Mark, do you do you have any uh, comments or thoughts that you want to chime in? What what I wanted to add is that it really takes a while for you to know yourself, know what it is really that you're passionate about, and doing beyond the technical. Right, I'm referring to the soft skills, uh, because the team, a, a good cross functional matrix team, needs a lot of different characters in order to move forward. It needs someone who's very detail oriented, but it can't have all the team be detail oriented. It needs someone who has a good strategic vision, but it doesn't need that all the team members will have a big vision, uh, strategic thinking. It needs someone that has the skills of um, being operational, like Patty mentioned, that program management piece, but it doesn't have to have all the members have that same skill. So, you know, reflect on yourself, A, what do you feel is your strength and what drives you, like what motivates you uh, as well when you go through this process of, you know, growing from a student to, uh, to, to your first uh, position in, in industry or academia. Great. Mark, anything to add? Uh, just, you know, in entry level positions, we're always expecting to train. So we're, we're not looking for a perfect background. We're looking for that in, for initiative, for communication skills, for asking questions, for things like that, and more, more to the soft skills as well, you know, the curiosity. So um, it's, I, I, don't, don't, I encourage you to, you know, think about those paths. And as Patty said, um, you know, there's a lot of paths, try, try some, and, and if they don't click, try another one. <laughs> Indeed, that is so true. Uh, so I, I want to pivot to networking and mentoring. We, we sort of touched on it um, in our panel. Can, can you um, tell us, you know, how networking and mentoring played an important role uh, in your career path? So let's start with you, Mark. Well, I, so I got my, my first, so after, uh, when I graduated from college with a bachelor's degree in chemistry, I was sure of only one thing, and that was that I didn't want to be a chemist. Um, and at that time, I, I did not have the, the creativity to think of a job that I could try, and so I went to graduate school. Turns out that was fine. It's not for everybody, and I'm, I'm not sure that I would encourage someone to go to graduate school just because they can't think of something, something better to do. Um, 
likewise, when I finished graduate school, I wasn't really sure what I was going to end up doing. Um, and I, I just really lucked out uh, with uh, getting a postdoc with Craig Venter. So his lab worked on neurotransmitter receptors. Neurology was not something that I <laughs> knew what was going on, but he was also working on genomics. And that turned out to be a great fit. And then I think what I learned from him really, um, because he, he He's a person who who thinks by talking. And uh, my first year with him, he spent on the phone with about four of us in his office on the speakerphone while he talked to a bunch of different people about in, in the early days of the Genome Project. And that really encouraged in me this idea that you, you know, getting out and talking to people is important. And in areas that are outside of your area of expertise, in, uh, especially. So it's, you know, collaboration is, is talking with your click. And um, networking is talking outside of your click, I think. And uh, as, as a natural introvert, this is something that doesn't come easily to me. And so I try to think of it as, okay, I'm gonna be an extrovert for half an hour and I'm gonna do that and do my best at it. And then I can go back to being an introvert once that little network I'm, networking opportunity is over. Um, so just one other thing to say about that uh, is that I, the, the network is really, there are a lot of different ways to think about that. It's people who are ahead of you in cla in classes, you know, or alumni, always a great resource. People who have worked at a place that you're interested in applying to, great resource for information about that. Uh, name dropping is always good in the in a cover letter or in an interview. I know so and so who worked there and really enjoyed it. Um, these things like this can really make a difference. And, and so the, your peer network is also very important as well as the sort of faculty or other kinds of networks. And I'll, I'll pause there and let someone else speak. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Shira next. Um, Shira, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, networking is, is um, when I think of myself after undergrad, it was a little awkward uh, thing to do, like, but it really is, translates along the years is just having casual conversation with people so you get to know them and they get to know you um, and it's a very common practice I mean you do this every day when you go fill up your gas and you bump into someone uh, you know you, you network right you, you talk with people uh, you know you network all the time so it's not something that I think is only for work purposes it's also out life outside of uh, work life where opportunities can because um, that networking piece will allow you to grow uh, at different, not, not, you know, it's a lot about the soft skills, growing those. Um, and so, um, and you never know when, where these networking will come from. So um, just try to step outside that comfort zone and, and uh, start to do that. And uh, whether it's through LinkedIn, whether it's through going to um, uh, meetings that are organized in, in within Connecticut. There are a lot of organizations that support networking and just start that pathway uh, through there. Yeah, thank you, Shira. Um, Yashoda and Patty, any, any um, relationships or mentoring uh, experiences that enabled you to get to where you are? Yashoda? Um, oh, uh, Patty, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I just want to come back to the, the mentoring. Have lots of them. They're, they become your advocates. Um, you, they don't have to be long-term mentors, even if you only have one or two conversations with them about kind of your passions, where you might want to, to grow or a career you're interested in. It just lets them know, because if they see an opportunity, they may throw you your way. Hey, I spoke to that a student who's interested in X, Y, or Z. So have lots of mentors. I think it goes to Shira and Mark's concept of uh, networks, but let them know, hey, if you see something, think, think of me. And, and it, it creates even more opportunities. Yeah, make, make it easy for them to help you. Right. Yeah. Yashoda, anything to add? Um, yeah, really quickly. I am one of those people, extreme introvert, who, kind of hid from networking um, just because I didn't know how to talk to people or what to talk to them about. Um, but I did embrace mentoring because I'm better with one-on-one. -on -one. And I think you, you're you surrounded by potential mentors. Take advantage of that. And you, you can have, like Patty said, it can be a short-term mentorship or it can be for years and it can be 
it can be your peers, it can be your professors, it can be someone you try to connect with on LinkedIn. Um, there are lots of opportunities to find mentor and they're a really great way of helping you look at your career path different, differently and help you identify additional um, opportunities that you probably wouldn't normally think about. Wonderful, thank you. So um, conscious of we have 10 minutes and I'd like to ask a, um, a final question at least from my perspective unless um, we get some questions from the students. So for each of you, um, here's a question. What, what advice do you have for our students when they are um, getting ready to look for a job? How should they go about it? Are there any tips that you've seen to be uh, proven to be successful for recently graduated students? So let's, um, let's, let's start with you, Yashwada, since uh, you just wrapped up the previous question. Um, so a couple of things, and, and this is, Patty has mentioned this quite a bit already, but LinkedIn is a really great place to start. You know, identify people who are in the field you want to be in or have a job that you would like, and you don't necessarily have to ask them to connect. Some people might not want to connect with you if they don't really know you, but you can, you can definitely chat with them and, and ask for some advice. Um, use your resources. As I mentioned earlier, you're completely surrounded by resources, your teachers, your professors, um, events like this, LinkedIn, the internet, they're all there to help you. You can start by Googling, Googling your interest, Googling your major and saying, what jobs can I get with this? And that can take you down a rabbit hole of possibilities you probably have never even thought about. Um, and then think about connecting your interests. For example, if you like biology and you like drawing, think about being a medical illustrator or animation. Um, and then I, I think finally, for me, it's don't limit yourself. You're gonna have many people in your life telling you not to do something and you shouldn't be one of those people you have to keep an open mind and explore all your options. Um, you just never know where you're gonna land. Wonderful, so just a very, very open mind. Wonderful, wonderful thought there. Uh, Mark, your thoughts. Uh, I, I, um, I might be old fashioned, but I am a big fan of the cover letter when applying for a job. Uh, I feel like uh, your resume, anyone's resume, doesn't tell your story. It, you have to tell your own story and why you're particularly interested in a job. And I think you know, indeed in other places, it's easy to just, you know, you load up your resume, apply now, apply now, apply now. I don't think quantity over, you know, quantity might work, but if you're if there's a particular opportunity that you're interested in, I think it's important to sell, sell yourself as in why you're interested in that opportunity and why your background would make you a good fit for it. And you know, don't that's not a brag. It's not an opportunity to just brag, brag, brag. But it's uh, a chance to just tell your story of who you are and why this seems like it might be a good fit for you. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Patty. Yeah, um, I think building on what what Mark and Yashoda said, I, I agree. Be be open to a lot of different career paths. I think sometimes having a preconceived notion that. This role is not for me without actually understanding what a particular job is, can, can limit yourself. So I would cast a wide net, try to triangulate on your interests. I mean, if you are in fact a statistician and you just want to write um, statistical uh, analysis code, find yourself as part of, of that organization, find people doing that job, create that network, and then look for those, those spaces. I'm a fan of the cover letter too, but the cover letter doesn't get to me necessarily until it gets past another space. So you have to have that network going side by side. So I would, I would tell you, tell your story, but build the connections um, alongside it. And if the connections aren't obvious, uh, I think you showed us that even look for opportunities to volunteer. How could I, if, if you wanted to work at Jack's Labs, what does Jack's Labs run? Can you, can, are there ways to connect to, to Jack's labs? Those are sorts of things I would, I would really start to, to think about. Um, and, and be willing to take a role even just for uh, a year, learn from it and, and grow and move on. That's, that's acceptable. Um, 
I know at Pfizer, we're a large group. We, we want to grow people. We don't want to lose you to other jobs unless they're within our company. And so we really look to, to grow you um, and expose you to a wide variety of, of opportunities. Take advantage of those. Wonderful. Thank you, Patty. Um, Shira. Thank you. Um, I wanted to add that, um, that keep in mind that with, the, I think one of the best advices I got is that your first job, nor is your third job, has to be the perfect job. But make sure that you grow from it. Make sure you, you gain something and learn from it, something that would take you to your next, to the next level, to the job that you really see yourself uh, fitting and being passionate about. So it doesn't have to be the perfect job, but again, make sure you grow, you have opportunity to learn, you get exposure. Um, I think that's, that's a key advice that I wanted to relay uh, uh, the people who are on the call and listening. And um, also when you network and interview and talk with people, make sure you also give examples of, you know, when you say that you're X, Y, and Z in terms of character, always share an example because that really brings a flavor. It brings it to life. And it makes the person talking to you um, feel like, okay, now I'm really talking to to this person, and I and I'm getting to know him or her. So just uh, these are my two, my two uh, advices that I wanted to to share. Wonderful. And 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 to add one more on top of all the great advice that all of you had to share, um, this was a, a success for my nephew who in, uh, applied for a position internship at Pfizer, and in it he actually put in that he likes Frank Sinatra. And that resonated with the hiring manager. So don't don't be afraid of sharing something personal about you that that the uh, hiring manager can relate to. We have uh, just about a minute. I have one quick question, and maybe I'll ask you, Patty, to respond to it in, in about a minute or less. Um, earlier, you talked about open software and existing tech um, that might be of value. Is there a general platform that the bioscience community turns to when looking for these technologies? Um, I can only really speak to, to my area, but we look to the R Consortium. R, R is an open source code. We look to the R Consortium who has all kinds of projects from all kinds of industries that, that use it for that particular platform. Okay, um, and um, the cover letter- That's heavily one. used in our area too. And I think it, it's, a, it's it, there's a little bit of programming, a very data-centric focus and widely used across a lot of areas. Um, okay. it's, it's a great platform to look into if you are interested in that sort of area and haven't been exposed to it. Okay, one more question, 30 seconds to answer. Uh, relevant students saying, if you don't have relevant or limited experience in a field that you're applying for, what should you put in your cover letter? If you don't have direct experience in it, what should you put? I guess say that uh, how excited you are about learning something new. Yeah, exactly. Explain why you're interested in it and what you can bring to it. Um, to build your case. It doesn't necessarily have to be exactly what they're asking for, but tell them what's special about you um, and why you're going to be a success with that position. And to echo something that Mark said earlier, you know, we are aware or the hiring is aware that this is a fresh student from undergrad. So that, that you know, the expectation is realistic. So. Yeah. Very good point. Very good point. So thank you all so very much for taking the time and sharing your insights. Uh, I know I walked away learning a lot and uh, definitely certain our students who are so engaged have gotten a lot out of it. So thank you very much. Over to you, Christine. Perfect and perfect timing. Um, Wow, I just have to say that was just amazing. I wanna thank Usha, the panel. I was rapidly taking notes. I don't know how everybody else was doing, but I think just learning so much. And I didn't, you know, that plus the keynote really has set us up. And I just have to say that you are students in for another treat. Um, we're now switching gears to a skills acquisition workshop and networking session. Uh, you've heard about the importance of professional networking. I will tell you it's been hugely important to my career. I'll also tell you that I'm not the best at it. So I'm gonna be listening too and taking some notes at this session. And, and it, really, it really can be life-changing. Um, so in this portion of the program, you're gonna be offered a workshop. 
you will get some pointers, and, you'll, and then you'll get a chance to practice. So thanks in advance to the professionals that have volunteered their time. They're here. They're ready to talk with you. So please take that time, students, to meet with all of them. And also, complete the survey and stay until the end. You have the opportunity to win a VIP tour and networking session at Jax, and also a fleece from Biopath. These are things you really want to have, so stay. Um, so I'm going to be handing things over to Amy O'Shea. Amy serves as the Interim Director for the Office of Career and Professional Development. Amy and her team help students define and in, in, enact their own definition of career success and followed to Kristen Seda, who is Southern's new coordinator for corporate partnerships and experiential learning. Kristen's position is made possible by combined funding from Southern and the CTNX New Haven Innovation Collaborative. I'm now gonna hand things over to Amy and Kristen for the workshop. Thank you so much for the introduction there. We are excited to be here today. And I believe Amy is going to be presenting first about networking. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Great. And what I'm going to do is share my screen. And I just need a thumbs up to make sure that this is working. Excellent. Thank you. OK. I am, I am really excited to be here today with you all. First and foremost, I really want to commend you for taking part in today's experience. Um, it is so well worth it. It is so important um, and it will definitely have an impact uh, in, in the way you move forward with your career development. So uh, today I am presenting about 20 minutes. Um, to really get you geared up for the next sec uh, uh, section of our program today, which will be a networking experience um, with some really great uh, organizations. So um, I, I work with students, I've worked with students at Southern for about six years uh, in, in helping with their career journey and figuring out where they wanna be, how, how they wanna get there, um, and, you know, I would say the most rewarding thing is when I hear from a student who gets that internship that they've always wanted or they've, you know, they've got that uh, acceptance into their grad program or they've received a word that that job with an organization is coming true. And um, so I am really happy to work with all the students after this experience. Um, and, and help you uh, get to those, uh, those, uh, those outcomes. Um, I do work with all of the students in arts and sciences um, and, and I'm happy to continue the conversation um, after today is, is completed. So without further ado, I am gonna get to our slides. We are gonna take you through a really great um, workshop to prepare you for the next session, but just to prepare you for networking in general, okay? So, um, the overview of what today's topics will be and how we're gonna focus uh, each area. Uh, we'll start with preparing for networking. And really this is preparing for networking in general. Today it happens to be a digital experience, but there will be other experiences that happen that aren't going to be uh, you know, through a screen. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We will get uh, focused in on the digital connection because that's what our experience is today. And then we will talk about in our last portion, uh, developing uh, next steps, really important when it comes to networking. Um, networking never ends. So when the event is over and the experience is over, there are steps uh, that you will want to make sure you follow through with and that uh, you continue um, to, to partake in. So preparing for networking, delving right in, whenever we have an opportunity to network, the first thing we want to do is define the, the purpose. And everyone's going to do that, not just the students that are participating, but the employers as well, right? So defining a purpose of networking, is this to um, learn about internship opportunities? Is this to learn more about the industry? Is this to just get some information about an employer? Really sort of naming the goal of the networking uh, experience and, and why we're moving forward with it will sort of set us up 
for a better conversation and also just bring a little bit more intention into what we're doing. So always sort of identify, why am I doing this? What, what is this for me? And it's maybe it's just to learn more. And that's a really good purpose. Um, Secondly, once we've named our purpose, once we understand what this is for, we really want to take a look at who's coming to the table. If we are able to see this list ahead of time, we want to research. We want to know vision statements. We want to know the mission. We want to know trending topics of these organizations. What are they? What are their, uh, you know, their initiatives, right? Where, what are they known for? So researching organizations, taking time to look into companies, even if you have a list of people who will be there, you can check those people out too. It's really cool and, I, and, and hearing from the panel, it's really cool to see if LinkedIn will um, sort of give you some indication into uh, a, a person and a commonality that you may have, right? Someone mentioned something about Frank Sinatra, right? It would be really cool if you go into these, um, uh, you know, experiences knowing a little bit about the people. In some cases, networking experiences, we don't know who's going to be in the room. And that's okay, too, as long as we're stating our purpose and we're ready to share. Um, but when we do know who's going to be in there and we have the time to prepare and we can learn about those companies and organizations, we can almost put ourselves on their team and in their um, community a little bit more. So it's a really important step. If you're a student on, on, on the call that hasn't done that today, that's okay. This is a first step into networking. This is definitely going to be something that is an awesome experience, whether or not that, um, you know, that, that time was, des was designated ahead of this. So uh, that third area there, as we're grounding our experiences, is creating that elevator pitch and making sure that we're ready to go, right? We are ready to um, connect and to, uh, market who we are and talk to people about that. So we will delve into that uh, a little bit more because I do think it's complicated sometimes. We feel like we've got to be all business and we have to make sure that what we're saying is perfect. And we really want to make sure that these are created authentically with um, having fun in mind um, and making sure that, uh, you know, we leave feeling good about what happened. So we'll delve into that a little more and give you some tips on how to do it. And then connecting with confidence. So once this is done, it's really sort of stepping into that role of, okay, I've practiced, I've practiced, I've practiced, I've done it, right? If it's a digital experience, I've popped on a Zoom call with my friends and I've, I've done it that way. Um, if it's an in-person experience, I've chatted in the room with friends or I've looked in the mirror and sort of done my pitch, right? So uh, it's really sort of that next step of, of being ready. Um, Okay, so elevator pitch. I like to break it up into three separate parts here. It helps to really sort of uh, look at it this way. Um, and there are layers within the parts, but just to sort of give you that one, two, three. I like to do things in threes, but right? I think that's kind of an easy way to put it. So first, you're introducing yourself with a greeting, right? So, uh, you know, your name and a statement. I'm really happy to be here today if that works for you, or this has been such an exciting morning, right? So something along those lines that can really truly just set the tone in a positive way and in, in a way that you are eager to engage and that you start off with a smile, I think it makes a difference. That second area there, providing a summary of what you do, right? So really truly thinking about that. Well, I. Uh, I'm, I'm the VP of the bio club, right? Or I'm, so really thinking about whatever it is that you do, you're a student, you're a leader on campus, you're an aspiring scientist, you're whatever that is coming up with a statement to uh, provide a summary, okay? And I mean, these are just, you can certainly have two sentences under each of these. This is just sort of that tip of the iceberg to get to rolling. Um, defining what you may want. Again, it goes back to that purpose. You've already stated your pur purpose and identified that. So here, that's simple, right? I'd love uh, to learn more about uh, your organization. I would love to hear about internship opportunities today, right? So remember, we're going back to that purpose. We grounded our experience. We knew why, we, we stated why we were uh, participating. And, and, and this, is, this is how we end up that, that, uh, and that uh, elevator pitch there. So sometimes it's like, okay, I'm going to break it down to those three pieces. But how do I really understand when I delve into conversation? How do I really understand what I should bring to the table? So I like to do what, how, who, and why, okay? And you can take a piece of paper before, 
uh, you're when you're developing this elevator pitch, you take a piece of paper, what I do, separate one, how I do it, who I do it for, and why I do it. And, and on that sheet, two to three sentences ex uh, explaining each, right? So what I do, I lead the bio club on, on campus, how I do it. I'm a motivational, situational leader who's hands-on and available. Who I do it for, an institution for higher learning that is focused on and committed to social justice and anti-racism. Why I do it? Because this brings me closer to, to my passions and what I'm driven for, and it helps me develop personally and certainly professionally, right? So when you have these pieces of paper and you've identified what, how, who, and why, you can bring more to the table in an impactful and intentional way. You are able to um, give indication into who you are as, as someone who, um, who wants to grow, who wants to be in this field, um, not just because this is what I'm studying, but because I care about it, I'm committed, um, and, and, and I'm interested in the opportunities. So I think, though it's hard to come up with these elevator pitches, using this kind of template and like sort of breaking it down this way might help in the process of, of, of um, you know, getting one down that you feel really comfortable with and that you feel, again, ready to connect with confidence. Um, after the elevator pitch feels good, after you know the who, the what, the why, the how, really what you're gonna do is prepare yourself as your full brand, right? We're people, we're not brands, but we certainly wanna make sure that what we say matches what we do, um, how we look. Uh, so really sort of connecting to uh, each of these events and experiences that you're networking at and understanding is it, it what's the dress? How should, I, how, how should I look? Is it professional? Is it business casual? Understanding what that is and then stepping into that. Um, cleaning up your social media, especially when you're going to be digitally connecting. Um, if you are connecting and presenting who you are in a digital way, we want your social media to match what you're presenting in that, in that day and what you're moving towards. So if you know what your, uh, you know, why you're networking, think about that and then think about does that, what, is that what your social media is also conveying, right? Um, so cleaning it up and making sure that that follows your messaging. Um, uh, robust and ready LinkedIn. Lots of students create a LinkedIn and say, oh, I have a LinkedIn. Lots of people can have a LinkedIn and then there's people that have a LinkedIn. So we wanna make sure that you're on the side of I'm using this in the right way. I think the panelists mentioned it a few times. It's really important that this is a part of your networking process because again, those next steps, remember the action plan we're gonna get to, those next steps um, are gonna, are, are gonna uh, be uh, in, in part on LinkedIn. So you wanna make sure that that's ready to roll. So someone says, I had a great conversation with Kristen. I'm gonna check her out on LinkedIn. And if you don't have sort of that up to date to sort of showcase, um, yeah, this is who I am. What I said to you was authentic and I meant it and my LinkedIn is gonna prove that. Then we gotta spend some time creating that and figuring out what works best. Um, and then business cards. So today, business cards wouldn't work. Other networking experiences and events and days or fairs or whatever it may be that has this personal uh, on ground in person sort of vibe, really cool to have a business card that you can make and create on your own with some cool bullet points on the back just to express some of your talents and certainly contact information. It's an easy way to make someone remember you um, in a different way. And looking and being authentic is a piece of networking and something we have to make sure we stay focused on. Um, secondly, understanding the participants is important as well. If you know you're attending this networking event with uh, peers, people that are in classes with you, you know, it's college students, you know, it's, um, I don't know, maybe uh, leadership, leadership groups on, on campus, understanding who's in the room, because it's really important that you can navigate conversations with those people as well. There's not always going to be an available uh, employer or organization rep for you to chat with, and conversations should 
should consist of elsewhere, should exist elsewhere. So understanding who's in the room, figuring out about these experiences um, and your message to others should also be matching the messaging that you're sharing with the organizations and the companies. What you want to really focus on uh, when you're thinking about the participants is what makes you unique. We all have our uniqueness. If everyone in the room has a lot of similarities, we're all studying the same stuff, we're all you know, performing in high, high, high level uh, academic standards, you know, we've all done this one biopath internship, whatever it may be, um, we want you to identify why you're unique. We want to hear from you in a different way. So remembering that as you're preparing this self, as you're preparing your brand, what makes me unique? Why would I hire me over someone else? What's the difference? What is what is my uh, you know what is um, something I'm really excited to express? And that can be something personal. That could be something um, through your academics that you've achieved. That's pretty cool. Um, but it's identifying that so that, that way you understand your participants and you're all of this together. But you've got a uniqueness that you can't wait to share. Um, okay. Once you've got the elevator pitch, you've prepared your brand, you're ready to go, you're gonna present your best self, right? Please be realistic about our environments these days, right? We have masks sometimes, we have um, technology that's not working always. Um, there are things that will creep into your networking experiences based on the world that we live in. It's okay, um, and be aware of that. Right, So I think when we do this piece where we're practicing, if you know you're coming to an event where masks will be mandated, practice speaking in your mask, right? Practice doing those type of things. I think it's, uh, it will be very important that um, you feel comfortable in the environment that you're in. And things are always shift, shifting and changing and that's just life in general, but certainly the, these days. Um, remembering your, your voice, your volume, your body language, all of it will send messages, right? So we really want to make sure that practice happens and that we can present ourselves um, in the best way so that we can get our point across without feeling uncomfortable. So practice is really important. Um, and again, in my office, we can certainly practice through this type of uh, experience and event for the next ones that you have coming. Um, that's what we're here to do. So moving on to the next section. Uh, not spending as much time, but just to really sort of give uh, the right sort of recognition to a digital experience and why that's a little bit different. Um, same thing with defining our purpose. Anyone involved is defining their purpose, right? So we want to make sure, same thing, uh, we know why we're here. Remembering that these digital experiences usually have a time frame. And sometimes when you're networking in person, it's a five o'clock till whenever sort of event. Right? These usually have a time frame. You want to make sure that you're not monopolizing conversation or that you are, uh, you're aware of how to share that. Employers and organizations will do this as well as uh, participants that are uh, there to network. Leveraging personal experiences, getting that pitch ready. You may not have a clear opportunity to state your elevator pitch in a digital experience. You might be using the chat function for questions. You might be using the chat function for different things, but having that ready to go is always really important. Identifying note-taking, it's interesting. You wanna make sure that you are ready to, if it's to write your notes, to take uh, down information that is imperative to your next step process making sure, are, am I typing? Will I be taking notes this way? It, 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 every, everything that happens that's, um, that should be uh, memorable won't just sit there. We've gotta make sure we write it down. So identifying how you're gonna do that. And organizations have to identify that too so that they can keep it straight on who they've met and who they've chatted with. And then navigating the conversation. Again, is this a conversation that we're gonna be having? Shall I chat with others or should I, should I wait and 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 no, you know noticing ebb and flow and how that works? Um, digital view, making sure you've identified the technology that you're going to use. Is it my is it a mobile device? Is it a tablet? Is it set up uh, appropriately? Have I logged into this before? Do I know that it can it can function on this device that I've identified? And then understanding viewpoints, right? What sort of background should I have? Um, am I going to have my, my uh, camera on? Is it required to have a video on? Do I look the part again, right? So those type of things that need to happen and be worked through as you're talking about digital. 
um, as you're talking about digital experiences. Topics and areas for discussion. This is in, this is this is for everyone involved. Centering your personal journey, making sure that your academic um, experiences, certainly as a student, maybe some professional experience or internship experiences um, and industry observations. Everybody involved can talk about this. Mm -hmm. Secondly, organizational experiences. Again, uh, mis mission, vision, role-specific experiences. Certainly, um, we could talk about pandemic reflections and then centering where uh, where this is headed. Right? What's what's next up for this industry and get gaining knowledge, um, hearing from uh, employers, organizations on personal reflections, and again, contributing uh, your own as well. Feel free to also talk about today's forum, right? It's been incredible. There are some really great topics that can be discussed. This is so cool that you're a part of it and you can share why you're here and what you thought was, um, what you thought was, uh, you know, just awesome to hear today. Um, and I think it makes it really, really helpful for you to jump in with something you can already talk about. So please feel free to use what has already been discussed and just sort of have this conversation about it. Um, remembering tracking the time, ensuring uh, next steps when you leave the conversation that there are some next steps that you are aware of. And then uh, quickly we'll go through, um, so I want to save some time for questions. Action steps for uh, next steps. Reflecting on the session, so important, so important that you stop after this, you give yourself a minute, you take some breaths, right, after the day at two o'clock, and you say, okay, this went well. This I wish I did better. Um, I really liked my conversation with whoever it was from uh, whatever organization and getting that all down. Uh, reflection is important. And then identifying your calls to action and placing information where you can find it. You don't want to be like, oh, I spoke to Kevin from, right? We want to make sure that you can pull up that list and you know exactly because you've written it all down with your notes. Um, timing is critical. You want to make sure that you're connecting with people on LinkedIn quickly. Uh, the more time that passes, the less, uh, you know, memorable the, the interaction will be. So make sure you get it on your to-do list to do this stuff this weekend. Um, and then leveraging this. This is so cool that you get to do this. I'm so proud of you all for being here. I think it's going to be awesome. But, you know, make, making sure that you're understanding what it is. So it's facilitating this, this, uh, this more, uh, you know, uh, understanding and knowledge into your industry. Um, planning for continuing engagement, LinkedIn, whatever it is that you can connect, however you can connect, and building towards a, a, a beneficial connection. What do you offer? What do they offer? Um, final thoughts, wrap it up to save the time for uh, questions. Digital networking, it's, it's no less powerful than in-person networking, meaningful connection and dialogue um, is important and it, it does leave a positive Im impression and always choose that viewpoint of confidence, right? If you've prepared and you've done it and uh, you're ready to go, then, then go ahead and feel good about your next steps. Um, okay, so I think we're at time to open it up for some questions. I know Kristen and I will sort of uh, do the best we can to get anything answered. And then I know Kristen wants to take it over and sort of uh, give more of an indication into our next steps for networking. Sounds good. So I think we'll be looking for questions to come to us um, through the chat. Okay. And while we're waiting for those, you know, this is a lot of information and this is a lot. If you've never done a lot of networking before. I have to say it can feel a little intimidating and don't think you're the only one that gets intimidated. Like Dr. Broadbridge says, she doesn't feel perfect in her networking yet. And I don't know that any of us ever walk into a networking event saying, I love this. I can't wait. I know I'm just perfect at this. It's always a work in progress. So it's okay if that's where you are. Um, also, reach out to your career development center at your university to Biopath. We're here to help you be successful, not only in internships and job placement, but in networking and having these conversations, because this is a big part of that process. So, so it looks like in the chat, there's just one question uh, about business cards. And actually a student is asking, are people still using business cards? And it's a really good question. Um, so 
The answer is yes. It's dwindled some, right? We have these, um, these profiles online. Everything has shifted quite a bit. We aren't printing resumes anymore. Um, there's been a lot of changes in the way that we um, you know, make ourselves memorable. The reason I, I think it's important for students is because it makes you unique. And it goes back to that statement of why will I stand out, right? And if I can hands for an in-person experience, if I can hand someone something that gives them a little bit more about me that they have to put in their pad folio and later will pull out, yeah, I think that it makes sense. I think that it's important to do. Is it necessary to network? Uh, is it necessary to networking and to be uh, have a positive impact in networking? No, but it's that extra piece that if you can provide that, um, it, it's it's certainly helpful. Is it necessary uh, to be successful, but certainly helpful and something that I think people can, um, you know, walk away from the conversation and remember you just a little bit more um, than maybe someone who didn't have anything. And it looks like we have another question here about LinkedIn and what should be included on your LinkedIn page. Um, so key things, and I'm gonna, we'll go back and forth here, Amy. Um, you wanna have an image of yourself, okay? How to put a face to the name, especially if you're having an, if you're at an event, that really does help. You wanna make sure you have information, essentially a lot of what's on your resume can go onto your LinkedIn profile and start making connections. I think that if there's anything you need to do, it's not just have two connections on your LinkedIn profile. It's okay to link up and have connections with professors, your peers. Funny enough, you all are going to be professionals within the next couple of years. And five years from now, it's amazing that you know somebody that now works at Pfizer. As we grow through our professional careers, we move through those environments. And it's important to start those connections early and keep them up. Um, what else do you, what else am I missing here, Amy? I, 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 you're nailing it. I think one thing that I would add is making sure that you are connected to um, organizations on there. So you are following um, places that you could see yourself working, places that you are interested in learning about um, what their, their new initiatives are, when they're hiring, that you are, showcasing on your uh, on your profile, I have these organizations I'm following. And um, you can join if, if once you do get on LinkedIn and you take a take a, a look further, you can join different organizations on there too. So like future scientists of whatever, like you can ask to join these, then be privy to those conversations and then stack your, your profile in a different way, not just with, which is very important, your, your information from your resume or what you've done and your experiences, which certainly is going to uh, be really helpful. But you can also say like, I've taken it a step further to like put myself in these conversations of people that are in this field, um, that are moving towards this field and you know really sort of identifying on that profile that it's not just like here's my resume but there's a whole lot of stuff that i'm doing on here to connect to others and that opens the door to what kristen was saying more connections if you're joining these um, organizations that they have you can see the members um, linkedin is really cool in the sense of when you follow a company you get to see the alumni that work there um, and i don't know if everybody knows that about linkedin but it's a really super feature super cool feature that you can say this these there's you know four people from southern connecticut working at this organization and then you can see who they are and maybe you took a class with someone or maybe you can outreach and feel more comfortable to make a connection because you were both walking you know uh through through southern and, and they have these experiences together so um yeah, I would say just adding a, a little bit more. But LinkedIn is probably one of the most important steps, I think, because employers are going to check it out. And they do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question here. Is there anything you should not include on LinkedIn? And you were reading my mind. Um, I know for one of the things I caution students is putting a lot of personal information, not necessarily, you know, your professional info is great, but don't put your phone number or your personal address on that. They have a, an option sometimes even to post your resume. Be careful with what information you're putting out there because you don't want to have your own you know, personal details out there for the internet. It's okay to 
to hold some of that back. Maybe put an email address. It's a nice, safe way for people to contact you if you're not on LinkedIn and the messaging messaging on LinkedIn frequently. But just be careful what you do put on there. Anything else? I would, I would go that. I'd be careful. It is, it's a really great site, but it's an open networking site. So we want to make sure that we're protecting, you know, personal information, uh, but an email is fine, things like that. So I would say that. Um, and then I would, I, I wouldn't be afraid to put something in your profile that doesn't necessarily relate to the ultimate goal, right? Like diehard Yankee fan or something like that. I think that that's, um, you know, clever and fun and maybe gives you a little, a little, um, I don't know, step into somebody else's world there. So feel free to put some personal stuff in it. I don't think that you need to feel um, it has to be all business. Um, so a lot of students have questions. Should I put anything about like, you know, my who I am or anything like that? Yeah, for sure. I think a little bit of that, uh, you know, could fit. Absolutely. And like Amy had mentioned before, make sure everything's keeping on that message for your brand, your personal brand. And I know that sounds kind of hokey, but as you're having conversations within other groups, if one of the things that you are trying to portray is that you're a responsible, respectful individual who can work as a team, having a belligerent conversation in a group chat that other people can see may not be exactly what you want to do. Maybe that's something you have offline if you need to have a, a strong conversation. But just be careful of, of the, the person that you're portraying, especially in some of those groups where you can have some really interesting conversations. Um, just keep that in mind. So it looks like it is, I don't have any other questions coming through in the chat. And if you do have more, I'm gonna start talking about what's gonna go on in the next portion of the Bioscience Career Forum as far as networking. But if there are more questions, feel free. We can always pause and chat some more. So I am going to take a moment to share my screen. And here we go. All right, and hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I got a thumbs up here. So what we're gonna be doing in the next section is having one of those digital networking opportunities that Amy was talking about. Um, again, this isn't exactly like what it would be at a meet and greet kind of a thing, um, but from 1210 to 1255, we'll be talking, we'll be having the opportunity to speak with different companies and their representatives. So this is time to practice. Um, these are going to be industry leaders from local companies within our region. And please remember that they're here to talk with you. Okay, this is not, um, this is not the time to, to hold your questions back. They, we are actively hoping that you all are going to engage. So ask questions and have a dialogue. The way that this all is going to look, we will have five companies and they're going to be in different breakout rooms in Zoom. And each of you will have the opportunity to choose what room you'd like to go to to speak to a specific company for about 10 minutes. Again, this is your choice who you'd like to go and speak to. In each breakout room, the company is going to start off giving a brief overview of exactly what they do. Um, maybe some information about skills that they're looking for in new hires and potentially uh, positions that are going to be coming up in the future. Each room is going to be a little different based on that company. You'll then have the opportunity to ask questions and learn more about the companies. After about 10 minutes, we're going to bring everyone back to the main Zoom room and give you a chance to find another company to go and learn about and speak with. Now, as I mentioned before, sometimes networking we need a little nudge to get started. Um, so what we're doing this year, and I know we have spoke about it a, a little bit before, we have a raffle this year. And in each of these rooms, we're going to have um, some key questions that we hope you ask each one of our companies. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what those questions are as well in a moment. Um, once you complete the a raffle document, which we'll share with everybody that has all these questions on it, you'll be able to submit that on a Google form and we'll be 
selecting, uh, I think it's three participants to have a personal tour of Jackson Labs and also get a bio fleece, a biopath fleece jacket, which is pretty wonderful. The questions are gonna include things that you would normally find out during a networking event. Obviously the name of the company, the name of the representative. Now, hopefully you're gonna have a couple ways to do that, okay? One, you can li be listening for it. Always a really difficult part of networking is hearing someone's name and then trying to figure out how it's spelled. Digital networking is kind of great because usually underneath our faces, you see our full name and sometimes where we work, all of that fun stuff. So you'll have the name of the company, the name of the representative, we want to know what the color of the representative's background might be, okay? Because we would like to make sure that you were actually in there. So for me, it would be a blurred background um, and that's okay. So just whatever the description is, one thing that the company engages in. So this is going to be where you may need to listen carefully and ask some follow-up questions. An example job that they'll be hiring for all of the companies have been told that this is something that we're gonna be asking of them. So they're prepared. If they don't offer that information in their description, we're gonna to need to have somebody ask. And then a couple of key attributes for prospective hires. Again, we heard a lot in the last panel of the soft skills, hard skills that companies are looking for. Each of our companies is probably gonna have their own spin on that. So we wanna be listening carefully. Now. That's all I have for the description of our next session. Does anyone have any questions before we start moving towards that? I'm not seeing any in the chat. So again, when we move over into that main Zoom room after we conclude this part of the this uh, networking workshop, we'll be posting a Google form, and also a document that you'll be filling out. And this is a word processing document, so you'll be able to type in the answers, even if you wanna wait until after, because as Amy said, everybody should be taking notes. So make sure to make notes that you can use to answer those. Just type up a quick Google document and submit it with the Google form, and you'll be in the running for that personal tour and a fleece jacket. And I think, that is probably about it. Well, thank you all so much. Again, if you have questions, which I hope you do, contact Biopath, contact your career development center at your um, institution. Don't forget, once you graduate, that doesn't mean you can't call them again, all right? You will 100% um, have access to that organization after you graduate, and they hope that you do come back and work with them. Um, I did get one comment here in the chat. Um, we will be announcing at the end of the day who will be receiving that uh, personal tour and fleece jacket. I think that's three individuals there. All right. Okay, so we'll see everybody at the networking event. And then, of course, make sure to stay after that for our Young Professionals panel, which I think is going to be really interesting. Thank you all so much. We look forward Thank to seeing you. Have fun, everyone. Enjoy.
Welcome back to our main session of the 2022 Bioscience Career Forum. I attended some of those breakout sessions. I just want to thank the companies again for volunteering their time and also to the students, congratulations for taking the time to participate. So with that, we're on to the next segment of our program. This morning, you heard a keynote, you heard perspectives from senior scientists, and now I'm very pleased to say that we are now going to start a panel that includes our, our um, early career scientists. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to um, Sarah. Great, thank you, Christine. Yeah, it's it's. I'm so excited about this portion of the program because we have a great group of um, emerging scientists with us who are, you know, getting started and establishing themselves in their careers in in positions here in Connecticut. And so, uh, this will give you an opportunity to get a little bit of a more near peer perspective on um, some tips and strategies to be thinking about in terms of setting up your own career path. And so I think it'll be a nice compliment to what we heard um, earlier today from Patty Compton and some of the other uh, uh, professionals that, that have been, you know, spent many decades now in their careers. Um, let, let's step back a little bit and, and start to talk a little bit about more, um, you know, what to do in those earlier phases. So I'm so pleased to have uh, Vicki, Lionel, Amber, and Ashley with me here today. And I'm just going to um, call on each of them to uh, say their name and their position, where they work, and just a, a very brief, you know, one to two sentence introduction to the to the work that you do. So Vicki, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Yes. Um, my name is Vicki Victoria Godoy. Um, I'm a clinical genomic technologist at the Jackson Laboratory. Um, so I work in a clinical testing lab uh, specifically with COVID-19 currently. Great, thank you. And Lionel. Hi, my name is Lionel Maida. Uh, I currently work at Pfizer in global clinical supply within our clinical supply operations group. Um, and my day-to-day -day job, I manage the packaging and labeling activities of our investigational product that we supply for our global clinical trials. Excellent, fantastic. Thank you, Lionel. And next up, how about Amber? Hi, my name is Amber Fernley. Um, I'm an intern at Evolve Immune Therapeutics in Brantford. Um, and my typical day-to-day -day is assisting senior scientists on various projects throughout the lab. Great, thank you. And last but not least, Ashley. Hi, I'm Ashley Johnson. I work at the Jackson Laboratory with Victoria as well, um, but I work in clinical quality and I help to maintain all of our certifications, credentials, and the behind the scenes stuff that make us a clinical lab. Great, thank you. And so we'll get started with some questions that we've we've prepared and discussed in advance of this panel, but I do also want to invite our students in the audience, if you have a, a question that you'd like um, to address with the panel, please do feel very free to uh, type in your questions into the chat, and those will um, those will reach me, and then we can we can try to incorporate those into the discussion. So do not be shy if you have a, a question that you'd like to ask of anyone on the panel. All right, so we'll go ahead and get it get started, and I'm going to start things off with. Our most emerging scientist, Amber, who is on her internship right now and is a, an undergraduate at Southern, um, what made you to de decide to pursue a career path and a major in STEM? So my trajectory is definitely more direct. Um, I've always been interested in STEM. Uh, I connected a lot in middle school with my science teachers. Um, I knew going into high school that I wanted to go into STEM. So I looked for vocational agricultural schools um, and I settled on Sound School in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, so it was very science-based. Um, I knew that going into college, I wanted to have that experience and that background to have some extra leeway. And then going into college, I decided to major in general biology because I didn't have an exact concentration I knew I wanted yet. Um, so I, general, I could get a little bit of everything. Great, great. And Lionel, how about you? Um, what you know? What made you decide to pursue a, a STEM career path? Is that always the path that you were on, or did you um, have any twists or turns along the way? Yeah. So similar to Amber, I, I, I've always been involved in sciences uh, ever since I was a kid, doing science fairs and whatnot, growing up in elementary school. 
um, taking AP courses in in high school. And then after high school, um, I decided to go the pre-med route at UConn. Um, I, I'd been wanting, wanting to be a doctor for the majority of my life. It was a dream of mine um, until I actually shadowed a doctor when I was in college uh, and realized I was just doing it for the prestige and it really wasn't something that I truly loved. Uh, so I switched from uh, the pre-med track. I was always a biology major, um, but I kind of switched from uh, physiology and neurobiology to just biological sciences. Uh, but during my during my time in undergrad, I had done some undergrad research, so I had that experience. And uh, through networking and people that I had met, uh, I realized that my next next step might be in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so I stuck with and graduated with a bio major, bio degree, and then um, pursued a career in in pharma after. That's great, and yeah, I think that's a a great point that you make about you know, you enter college thinking one major and one career path um, because of some misconception maybe that you have about how that, um, about how that, that role really functions. And until you actually shadow somebody or get, or do an informational interview or, or get the actual experience, you don't fully understand exactly what it's all about. Um, Vicki or Ashley, do you want to add anything um, about your particular interest in STEM? I will say I started as an environmental science major and I had a similar similar story to Lionel where I realized that uh, in environmental science, there's so many politics involved that I didn't really enjoy it anymore. So I moved to biology instead. Interesting, interesting. Um, Vicki, why don't you tell us, let's shift a little bit and, and and talk about your your current position. You you mentioned that you're working in the clinical lab at at Jax. Can you elaborate a little bit about um, some of your current duties and responsibilities, and maybe what's one favorite thing that you like about about your position? Yeah, of course. Um, so as a genomic technologist, I work in a, cl a clinical lab, as I mentioned. Um, it is a virology lab. Um, the part of the lab that I work in, we also have a um, oncology lab attached to it, um, but I'm specifically in virology. So we um, deal with COVID testing. Um, so in the beginning of the pandemic, we had a really, um, we were partners with the state um, for testing and we processed millions of tests to date. Um, so it was very um, up-paced. It's very busy all the time, um, but I absolutely love it. Um, I think what I like most about the lab is the direct impact that you know I can make in patients' lives without being in you know without being in a hospital or direct patient care. Um, it's also really cool because I've learned so many skills that um, I don't think I would have learned if I was in a different setting. Yeah, absolutely, and. Vicki, maybe you can elaborate, and Ashley, you might also be able to jump in here. Can you explain maybe um, or describe what the difference is between working in a clinical laboratory versus working in a research laboratory? Because I'm not sure if, if everybody actually understands what the, those differences might be. Yeah, so um, with CLIA, we receive samples from hospitals or from patient care settings we test those samples and then we send out results. Um, although I am involved in a few projects in research, that's not the main goal of the lab. Everything that we do is for service versus a research lab. You can um, you would have a PI that's interested in different projects and they will develop different um, experiments and that's what you would work on. I don't know if Ashley wants to expand on. Yeah, that was really eloquently put. <laughs> I would say other than on my side of the department, it's all about um, what credentials you're holding and what allows us to do that type of testing. Um, because our clinical laboratory is direct patient care, um, we have to hold ourselves to a really high standard. Um, and I think we do a really good job of that. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah, I started my career path actually working in a clinical laboratory and I didn't fully understand the difference when I got the job. So I, you know, I think, I think that that's something that, um, that not a lot of students perhaps, um, understand that there's a whole other type of laboratory based, uh, positions and, and opportunities out there in the clinical realm that they can also consider. So Lionel, how about you? Can you elaborate a little bit more on your role at, at Pfizer and, and tell us a little bit more about your, your responsibilities and um, maybe something that you really enjoy about your current position? Absolutely. Yeah, so as of right now, our, our clinical supply uh, operations team group is, is going through a reorg to make us more agile and, and efficient and work at, at a light speed pace. Well, um, my day-to-day -day job uh, typically consists of strategizing with the supply chain lead and the rest of the supply uh, clinical supply team in order to come up with the best solution to package and label our the drug products that we are currently investigating uh, for our clinical trials. Uh, so we'll make sure that we're meeting all the regulatory uh, standards that that are that are needed. Um, we'll make sure that the the, the drug product is packaged uh, uh, from uh, th that makes it easier for the patient to um, uh, whether dose it at home or dose it at the clinic, depending on what the, the, the study uh, is telling us to do. Um, but we'll pretty much package it according to our protocol and according to our clinical supply agreement. Uh, make sure we're we're not missing any regulatory steps. Um, and once that's complete. Uh, once we have the strategy, I'll work with our external vendors. We have a couple of vendors that we use that will actually uh, go th through with the operations of actually packaging and labeling according to, to, to how we have strategized it and set up the study, uh, whether it's an open study or a blinded study, uh, making sure that we're not unblinding the study and that the people that 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 need to be blinded are, are not, you know, um, are not unblinded during during the packaging of the drug. Uh, so we'll do that, work with our external vendors. They'll complete the production of the actual package and labeling. Uh, they'll send us back the batch records. Uh, I'll make sure everything was done according to plan. And then I will send that to my distribution colleagues. We'll work on distributing those uh, drug products to the, the rest of our the, the world pretty much. Um, and as of last week, I actually just started a secondment, which is like a, a, a one-year trial run in uh, another position, uh, leading a team within our systems group, uh, where we're currently working on uh, automating most of our system processes uh, to to, to kind of make sure that you know we're working more efficiently. Um, we we have have a, a way of working called Lightspeed, uh, which came up after um, uh, the pandemic started. Uh, in order to get drug products out as quick as possible. So it's really important that we kind of change the way we work and automate most of our processes. Uh, so that's what my team will be working on for the next year or so. That's great. And what do you like about your position? Uh, what do I like? Uh, it, it can be very stressful uh, at times, but I, I like how, you know, there, no two days are the same. There's always something different popping up you know, um, always a new issue to solve. Um, you're always having to, to tap into other colleagues' knowledge in order to you know, come up with different solutions. You know, you could be in this, I've been in this role for only three years at the moment, um, but you could be in this role for 10, 15 years and, and, and see something new pop up that you might have to go uh, and, and, and seek out help from others for. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, our portfolio is constantly changing. So the way we package these drugs is is going to be constantly changing. So, so yeah, no two days are the same. It's um, it's it, it's a challenge, but it, it keeps things exciting. Yeah, sounds like there's never a dull moment. <laughs> That's great. Um, Ashley, you're you're working in you know quality assurance and and you know quality control. Maybe can you elaborate a little bit more about um about what some of your duties are as well and what are some of the things that you like about uh, about your position? Absolutely. Um, I would say some of the things that I really like about this position is the problem solving. 
Um, I feel like every day we have something <laughs> new that we need to um, pivot around and adjust. And the teamwork is probably my favorite part. I really, really like the way that we work not only with um, the clinical lab, we'll work with um, Vicky's department really closely, but we're also working with um, higher up organizations and jacks and even state organizations to problem solve things like supply chain or meeting certain credentials or um, just figuring out how we can supply all of the schools and all of the hospitals with the supplies and the tests that they need. Um, that I think is probably my favorite part at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah. Great. Thank you. And Amber, you're you're on an internship. You're you know learning a little bit more about what the biotech uh, experience and environment is like. So tell us a little bit about some of the things that you're learning, and what are some things that you like about your your current position at Evolve Immuno. Evolve. Yeah, so Sorry, <laughs> I forgot the name. <laughs> um, I definitely, uh, I really kind of like Lionel and Ashley mentioned. Um, you really get to see kind of a collaborative relationship. Um, Evolve Immune has a few different parts. Um, so really going to your colleagues, getting their input, um, it's, it's really great to see firsthand an internship. I mean, it's great because what I get to do is a range of a lot of different things. I get to help a lot of different scientists on what they're working on. So just being able to maintain and work with equipment that I've never even heard of before has been really rewarding as part of this internship. Um, but overall, I think that just seeing firsthand everybody working together and how everything comes together has been really great part that I've loved so far. Yeah, that's fantastic. Amber, I'm going to stick with you for a second here. So you're, um, you know, you're out on internship right now. Obviously, you know, throughout the day, we've been hearing about the importance of um, getting, you know, relevant experiences. Um, but let's let's think a little bit about sort of what you've been, the training that you've been going through as an undergraduate over the past few years. Um, can you elaborate on maybe some important skills or experiences that you had during your undergraduate experience that you think helped you to be able to land this uh, particular internship at Evolve Immune? Definitely. So I really think connecting with faculty and seeking out opportunities uh, has been a huge part of getting this internship. I know that my advisor had recommended that I talk to other faculty to see if there was some inter interesting research I might like to look into. Um, and that's how I started getting the experience that then led to um, applying and getting into Evolve Immune. So really connecting with faculty that could give me a foundation to really work from was just a huge, huge part of it. Um, and then in terms of seeking out opportunities, I think that, you know, as an undergraduate, you really have to advocate for yourself. You really have to go out, you know, message people. You really have to, to make a way to um, get to where you need to go. So um, those skills uh, have really been built up from faculty that I connected with. That's great. That's great. Vicki, do you want to contribute here a little bit, think, you know, thinking about the skills or experiences that you had in college, um, you know, how do you think that helped you to get to, to where you are in your current role? Yeah, for sure. Um, so obviously classes are really important, <laughs> uh, but I would say that the most important thing for me to get into the role that I'm at was hands-on experience. Um, so like Amber said, like definitely network, definitely reach out to professors. Um, if you can get into a research lab, if you can get um, some sort of wet lab experience under your belt, that is very important. Um, I think it's very valued in anywhere you go within, you know, science, whether it is in the wet lab or whether it's something like QA, like Ashley, or, you know, there are um, many other areas you can go to, but wet lab experience is very important. Mm, great. Lionel, how about you? Do you want to think about some of the experiences or skills or coursework that you, you know, that you thought was really helpful for you in college to help get you where you are right now? Uh, yeah, just to reiter reiterate what's been said is that undergrad research experience um, in the lab. Uh, uh, I think Vicky said wet lab experience is, is important. Um, yeah, I think at, at minimum, I think you need some kind of research experience, you know, uh, 
I had I had a I had a uh, I kind of had a weird uh, uh, internship, well, research experience uh, at at UConn one summer where I worked in the uh, bio biotech agricultural lab, which had nothing really to do with with my major, <laughs> where I was pretty much uh, studying different in, invasive species and 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 working with them, but you know it still helped to to kind of you know get 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 that experience and 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 put that on my resume, which which allowed people to see that I had that research experience. Um, I think that's number one. Um, even when I'm looking at resumes of new hires, uh, if, they, if when I was in the lab, if you were trying to look for a lab-based position um, and you didn't, you didn't have that, I, it was hard for me to kind of give you my my seal of approval, you know, without that experience. So I would say that's that's crucial. I would say that's number one. Yeah, and I love the point that you that you raise in, in talking about your personal experience doing, having a research experience that maybe wasn't directly aligned with where your interests were, you know, working in an agricultural lab, for example, even though you were more interested maybe in the biotech or pharma side of things. But um, I think that's a really important point that it, that especially at the early stages of your career, it's not always about the, the specific experience that you're getting in the topical area that you're studying, but more about the actual skills that you're developing and just the ability to um, you know, be immersed in a professional environment, in a research setting, um, and, and developing those technical skills and team um, interpersonal skills, regardless of what the actual research area of the particular lab is. So I, th- I, I appreciate that point. That's great. How about you, Ashley? Do you want to um, do you want to reflect a little bit on your college experience and, and you know, what do you think were some critical um, experiences or skills that you had that you developed in college that helped you to get where you are? Well, it's not going to be surprised that it's not very different from what everyone else said. Um, so it was a lot of reaching out and developing really great relationships with faculty um, that allowed a lot of different opportunities to come in. But on the academic side, those foundations are important. Um, and I just think it's really interesting that no matter how the technology changes, whether we're pipetting by hand or using a $10 million machine to pipette, we still have to know why we're doing it. We still have to know those foundations. Um, so between the academic side and the networking side, I think both of those together is really what's going to get you propelled forward. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, and I think, you know, all of you have mentioned a little bit in your responses um, sort of the power of, of networking. And so I want to pivot a little bit and and take a deeper dive on that. We Our, um, our attendees just came from a uh, skill building networking session and had the opportunity to interact with some of our industry professionals from across the state. Um, But I wanna hear from each of you sort of your personal experiences with networking and with job searching, Um, you know, so tell us a little bit more about your, we'll start with you, Ashley. about your, you know, how you learned about the the current role that you're in and how you landed that position and what were some of those specific networking strategies or job search strategies that you used? Yeah, so I owe a lot of it to the faculty at my community college where I started, especially um, Professor Gusky. Um, I was lucky enough to be in a department that just continuously handed us opportunities um, for NSF grants for grants through NASA, um, different types of internship. And I actually found um, the JAX internship through that department. um, And I I came out and I interned for a week, or I shadowed for a week, excuse me, um, and was able to build a lot of connections here. Um, And then also through just the community college um, and then the Connecticut College Network, I was able able to build a lot of networking opportunities through that as well. Unfortunately, COVID hit, so I didn't get to utilize a lot of them at that time, but with things picking back up, I really can't wait to get back into um, at least volunteering my time and and volunteering to either mentor or volunteer at the community colleges um, to to give someone else an opportunity to. Yeah, that's great. Lionel, how about you? How did you, how did you land your position and tell us a little bit more about your networking and job searching strategies? Yeah, so I guess 
So me, I'll, I'll take it back because I, I think uh, I think I'm a little bit on the older side of this panel because um, I'm coming up on my tenth year in the industry now. Um, so I'm about ten years removed from college. You're so but... you're so old, Lionel. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but anyway, so my first job at Pfizer, um, I actually so I've had three positions at Pfizer. Um, every single one of them I've been referred for. Um, so, so that says a lot about getting jobs in, in, at a company, right? Um, so the first step, right, was getting in the door, get my foot in the door, which, like I said, that undergrad research experience or internship, if you're a finance major, whatever, some kind of internship, you have to have it, get in the door. So I had that experience. Um, and at the time I was working at UConn Health Center during the day as a data research assistant. Um, and pretty much I was, yeah, that was part-time and I was looking for a full-time position. So I was searching every day on all websites, what, whatnot. Um, and I actually had a connection through my father of a postdoc fellow who was working at Pfizer at the time, right after, right after, right when I graduated. So my dad introduced me to him. Um, and once I met him, he actually brought me on site and I told him that I was interested in working in the pharma industry. He brought me on site to, to Pfizer before I even had seen any job I was interested in. Um, and we spent a day there and, and just pretty much I met three, uh, it was three people that I interacted with, had three different meetings, um, got their numbers, their contacts and whatnot, sent them my resumes and, and kind of built that relationship um, up front. And then as I was searching for jobs, about a few months later, it must have been like four or five months later, uh, I actually came up, up upon a contractor position on Craigslist. Um, and a lot of these positions, especially contract positions, they don't post where it's at. They just kind of post where the city it's in and whatnot. And that's at a farmer company in, 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 in Groton, Connecticut. So I assumed it was Pfizer. Um, and I applied for this position. And once the recruiter told me it was at Pfizer, I reached out to my network of people that I had met months previously. Uh, and one of them actually knew the hiring manager, put in a good word for me, and I was able to get my first position there. Uh, and from there, I started off in drug product development. From there, I was referred for a full-time position um, through someone, uh, one of the senior scientists that I was working with daily. He referred me to my next position. And then for my current position, I was referred uh, by another colleague. Um, so pretty much every every position I've had has been through networking, even mm -hmm. Even jobs when I, I remember being in college, it was always through a referral from someone, you know, just tapping to my network, seeing who knows who. Um, mm -hmm. And as long as, you know, you have the track record, you know, if you have a relationship with someone and, and you have the, uh, a positive track record, uh, you know, they're, they're gonna refer you for a position. Uh, so that's really, that's really how I've gotten all my jobs, you know, it, it, I, I always tap into my network. Um, I always try to reach out to people ahead of time to see how they're doing see if I can help people out before they help me. Um, and and that that's always, you know, turned out positively for me. Yeah, that's, that's great. What a great story. And, um, you know, it, there's no shame in using your family as part of your network and using, you know, friends. I mean, think, think broadly, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, some professional that you met on LinkedIn all at, at all the all the time. You know, sometimes we can tap into those more personal um, personal networks as well. Just again to make those initial connections. So I, I think that's great. Um, Vicky, do you want to talk a little bit about networking and job searching strategies that you used? Sure. So my story is similar to Lionel, actually. Um, so my mom is a house cleaner and she used to clean the house of someone that worked at Jack's previously. Um, so by saying that I was interested in science and everything, um, this lady, Laura, she was great. She actually brought me here um, for a tour. I left my resume and everything. Um, and then I kept applying for positions and then the pandemic hit. So then they were looking for people for the CLIA lab. And I was actually reached out to on LinkedIn. Um, and I already had connections with a few people from Jax because of Laura. Um, so a recruiter reached out to me about the position um, and she already had my resume because I left it at Jax already. Um, so 
definitely tap into any connections you have. Um, but also the importance of LinkedIn, because if I didn't have my profile, I probably wouldn't be in the position I'm at today. Um, it's very, very important. Um, definitely put all your skills out there, all of your experience, um, reach out to people, make connections, even if it's someone you haven't met face to face, leave a message or something. You never know where it could lead you. Yeah, absolutely. And our, our keynote speaker, Patty Compton, actually specifically called out LinkedIn and said she in, encouraged everybody to connect with her on LinkedIn and really drove home the importance of having that profile there and um, and making those those connections. So that's that's great to hear that that um, that that was a contributing factor to your success. And Amber, tell us a little bit more about the steps that you took to, to secure your internship with, with Evolve Immune. Yeah, so mine was a little bit different because um, at Southern we have our Biopath office, which is great at connecting students to jobs and internship opportunities. So Evolve Immune, I believe, had reached out to a lot of the local schools, just letting them know about the opportunity. Um, and this office sort of laid the groundwork for networking. So I was able to connect with them and they were able to help me with mock interviews, my resume, my CV. I worked with a number of different people in the office. And then they were able to help prepare me for this internship. It was a series of interviews of meeting people. And it really, it made a huge difference in my application. Yeah, that's great. and. You know, you're, you used your internal network within your university, and I think that that's a great place for current students to start. You know, start with the resources that are available to you. Start with your um, administrative, you know, program administrators, your career services offices, your professors within your department. Um, that's your that's your your bread and butter network right there, and then they can help you along the way to make those other uh, networking connections as well. So. Fantastic. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit and, you know, move away from networking and, and talk a little bit more about something that's a little bit different, and that's mentoring. Um, you and I, you, you, we have all had a discussion prior to today's event and, and talked a little bit about the power of mentoring and having mentors. Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about some of your experiences with with having a mentor and you know how that has helped you on your professional journey. Um, Ashley, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I would love to. Um, so I started out at Northwestern Community College in Winstead um, and I decided I was just going to exhaust all of their science classes because I really liked their science department and by doing so I got really involved with the faculty there. I knew everyone um, really well. I had classes with the majority of them. And I also did work study. And through kind of just really immersing myself in these classes and the opportunities that they had um, and in work study, it just kind of kept turning into more and more opportunities. Um, so not only was I mentored by my advisor, but I was mentored by all of the advisors <laughs> in that department, which was so, so beneficial. And not only did that support me and help me so much at my time at Northwestern, but when I moved into Central, half of the faculty had attended Central, so it carried over. And then it led into really wonderful relationships there as well. And then just through this really big community, um, I was just constantly pinged in opportunities, whether they were NSF grants um, or um, trips to be able to represent my college. Um, and I just continuously got to meet people. And, and now that I'm, and that's obviously how I found my position here at Jacks. I did that shadowing week. Um, and then now that I'm here, I, I'm still being mentored. My boss always sends us opportunities for trainings, for uh, ways to expand our skill set and it's just it never ends and then you feed back into it and hopefully you can find people to mentor too. Yeah, absolutely. So aside from your um, your current supervisor, do you have any other mentors that you know some of these faculty you mentioned, do you still keep in touch with them? Do you still consider them to be mentors? How do you maintain those mentoring relationships long term? So I follow a lot of them on LinkedIn, which I think is a great tool. Um, I also 
just in my own personal life, uh, strange situations. I was working in a restaurant and I'll overhear a conversation of some somebody and I'll say, hey, I think I know someone that can help you with that. Let me reach out to them. And so I will send them emails when I've overheard educators talking about something or I've um, heard people even in our own uh, Jack's family uh, need, need connections for certain things. Um, so I do still continuously send them emails yeah. um, and check up on them a little bit. Um, but I've, it's, it has unfortunately been a little challenging with COVID. I would really like to go and see them in person and maintain those connections and honestly just stop in and say hi. And I haven't been able to get on campus. <laughs> yeah. So that's been a little disappointing. So I'm hoping, hoping that I can still maintain those friendships face to face because they're really invaluable. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get, we'll get there. We'll get back to those face-to-face -face interactions eventually. Vicki, do you want to share some of your experiences? Do you have a mentor? Um, you know, how has mentoring contributed to your journey? Yeah. Um, so having a mentor actually completely changed the course of my career. Um, I went into college, so I went to UConn and graduated in 2020. Um, and I originally went in in the pre-med track. Um, and it wasn't until the end of my sophomore into junior year that I decided to switch, um, not completely switch because um, I majored in molecular and cell bio. So I continued within the same major. I just got out of the pre-med track um, because I started working in a research lab and my PI, Dr. James Cole, was the most amazing PI and showed me all of the things you could do with science besides, you know, being a doctor. Um, and that's how I decided I was like, now, like this, this is what I want. I want to see in research. Like this is what I'll be happy doing. Um, so definitely having mentors um, take, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, definitely use the resources you have, um, use the people um, because again, if it wasn't for his mentorship, I could have maybe gone to medical school and not been as happy as I am today. Um, but also even on my day-to-day -day life um, and at Jax, um, my bosses are definitely mentors and people I look up to um, and they push me to be better. Um, I actually went back to grad school now because um, my direct boss actually did the same program as I'm doing. So um, it's, it's very, very important and it's really good to have people to look up to. Um, and hopefully I can have people that look up to me one day too. Absolutely. Absolutely. How about you, Lionel? Do you want to share anything about how mentoring has impacted your journey? Do you have a mentor that you, that you work with right now? Yeah. I've, um, I've always, I mean, in my professional career, I've, I've always had kind of informal mentors, you know, um, not like a formal mentorship program, but I've had a bunch of people, senior scientists when I was in the lab that have helped guide me um, throughout my early career uh, at, at the time, because I, I started off in drug product development as a formulator, um, and then I moved over to a formulator for preclinical studies. And while was, those years I was in the lab, there's a lot of scientists that kind of guided me and just showed me, you know, what what was out there in, in my future if I, if I decided to stay in the lab, you know? Um, I, when I got into this, when I got into this industry, I never wanted to be a specialist. I kind of wanted to have more of a wide breadth of experience. Uh, so I had mentors that kind of showed me, all right, these are the, per, the, the the career paths or the pathways that you could have out outside of the lab. Um, and so I had people in the lab that were mentoring me. I also have this woman who's been mentoring me for for quite a quite some time. Uh, she leads our, our colleague resource group, the Global Black Community at Pfizer. Um, and I've learned a lot from her about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I, I've really built my skill set around, um, around, around those initiatives uh, through her. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've always had a, 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 bunch of, a bunch of mentors throughout my career. Um, I think it's very important. I think it's difficult to grow without mentors. Um, we do have, I think, um, like an executive mentorship program at Pfizer, but I think you actually have to be a director level at, or, or and up. Um, but at having just informal mentors regardless, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it, it, it definitely helps tremendously. Yeah. And I think um, 
you know, the program you just mentioned at Pfizer just demonstrates the fact that, you know, you're never too young or too old to have a mentor and just, you know, people that are very senior in their, in their professional careers still need to, to have mentors. And there's always, um, you know, there's always opportunities to learn from others and to, and to adapt and grow and evolve in your, in your field. So it's something I think that we need to stress as a continuous process. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, no, yeah. even now I'm, I'm currently going for my MBA through a, a joint venture program that Pfizer has with, with URI. Um, and I'm actually reaching out to my business law professor um, to kind of mentor me um, in, 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 in that field when it comes to uh, uh, kind of building businesses, uh, just because I learned a lot from him in, in, in my class and uh, a, a lot of the knowledge he has is valuable. So I'm actually going to reach out to him next week um, to, to discuss some few, few things for the future. So yeah, it, it never Great. stops. <laughs> Great. And Amber, who do you consider to be your mentors? Do you, uh, as an undergrad, do you have a mentor that you, that you seek guidance from? Yeah, so similar to Lionel, I've had a lot of informal mentors. Um, I know that definitely at the university, my advisor has been very helpful in helping me understand opportunities and everything that comes along with that. Um, but really um, a lot, my most, I guess, recent mentor is probably just working at Evolve Immune. I'm in a very fortunate spot um, that with my supervisor, she's really taken me under her wing to help me understand opportunities, to really um, work with me on career plans, trajectories. And again, I'm just in a very fortunate spot as an intern to have that ability. Great, great. So I'm gonna start with you on this next question, um, Amber. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of supports that are in place for um, new employees that are maybe embarking in a, in a totally different field or are taking on their first job. This can be a really intimidating and stressful time for undergrads. And I know I've counseled um, many undergrads on the job market who, you know, look at a job description with that has, you know, 10, 10 responsibilities listed or duties. And well, I only know how to do seven of those. So I can't do this job. And, you know, trying to explain that, that there's never the expectation that you're going to know and, and be able to do every single thing, um, you know, coming into a brand new position. And especially when you're in an, you know, in an entry level position or just starting out in your careers. So um, I'd love to hear everybody's perspectives, but I'll start with you, Amber, you know, going into this internship, obviously you're, um, a highly uh, capable and bright young woman, but probably had a few things you needed to learn along the way. So what kind of supports um, have been in place during this internship to help you be successful? Um, definitely. So sort of, I had a little bit of background working in a Southern lab. So I had at least basic experience, um, but yeah, definitely going in, I've asked a number of questions. My poor supervisor has put up with a lot, but um it, it's really, it's having these check-ins, it's having these, um, we have a, a system in place so that as we're working, we're growing towards the next thing. Mm -hmm. So always having, I guess, these checkpoints to sort of make sure that we understand what's going on. We know the task and what needs to be done, but really just making sure that we go through everything slowly and make sure we get that hands-on experience so that we have this understanding of what we're doing so that I can then apply that to my next position that I go into in life. Yeah, that's great. And Vicki, how about you? Do you want to talk a little bit about um, supports or trainings or, um, you know, how, how did you get up to speed, so to speak, when you, when you started in your, in your position at Jax? Yeah, um, I think what you said earlier is really important because we're not going to know every single thing that's required of us in our positions. Um, coming in, obviously, I had the basic skills. You got to have the basic wet lab skills to be in a clinical lab. Um, but there was a lot that I learned here. For example, um, next generation sequencing. I had no idea what that was <laughs> until I came into Jax. You know, I didn't have that skill set. Um, but having a close relationship with your supervisors is very important. Um, I reached out to them and I was just like, hey, like, what is this? Like, can I be trained on this as well? Like, I'd love to learn all these other skills. Um, but also there is 
obviously basic training on all the skills that you are required to know for your day-to-day -day job. Um, there are multiple trainings that we go through to be in a clinical lab. There are multiple um, media labs that we call um, protocols that we have to read. Um, and, you know, especially for HIPAA and things like that, because it is a clinical lab and we deal with patients, um, there is all of that um, paperwork that you have to get through as well. Absolutely. Ashley, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience coming on board at Jax and, um, you know, getting trained and, and getting up to speed with sort of your, your job duties? Yeah, I would love to. So it was kind of a strange adjustment for me moving into this role. I was pretty adamant that um, a desk job wasn't for me. <laughs> and I was pretty adamant that I love to work with my hands and be in the lab. And when I took this position, um, all of that undergrad coursework, all of these really heavy lab classes that I took didn't apply in the same way. So I write um, and audit a lot of the SOPs and training that Vicki does. She performs them, but I'm the one that's making sure they make sense, making sure that they're up to standard. Um, so I have this really interesting, um, I guess, point of view, because although I'm fairly proficient in beginner wet lab hands-on skills, I now have to transfer that into, okay, well, how do I communicate this in a different way? How do I see how this works on this side? Um, and that was really, really interesting. And I was pretty lost when I first started. I had to use all these tools and programs that I didn't know how to, um, but it truly was just the support and camaraderie and teamwork and gentle patience <laughs> from my from my peers that got me through it. And there was very little expectation other than I just ask for help and try. And I think that when you get into any position, um, what they're putting out is a wish list. And I think as long as you have that really great attitude of, well, I can try my best and ask for help. And as long as I'm receiving, uh, you know, help back in a really supportive way, then I can do this. Um, so yeah, it was it was a very interesting adjustment, but I really learned to love it. And I really learned to love all of the new things that I got to learn that were new and that I could utilize to to help the lab and help Vicki and, and help everyone in, in that area of the CLIA lab. Absolutely. That's great. Lionel, how about you? Um, tell us a little bit about supports that were in place uh, to help you or any training that you receive to help you, um, you know, fill in maybe some skill gaps or to, you know, to get acclimated to, to life um, when you first started out at Pfizer. Yeah, so as far as support systems, um, I previously just talked about our, our colleague resource group, the Global Black Community. And at Pfizer, um, a colleague resource group is pretty much a, a community of colleagues um, and it's open to anyone, but you know, it's anyone who's, who identifies with a certain community, whether it's um, an Asian, uh, Black, Latino, women's group, um, and people who identify as part of that community and, and are supporting their goals um, and values of that community and, and want to be more involved in those DE&I um, efforts. And those communities really help support our colleagues um, through different, uh, whether it's leadership conferences, different um, trainings, not just DE&I trainings, but professional trainings, um, skills trainings, whether that's, you know, um, trying to find uh, project management certification or trying to find different type of belt, uh, uh, belt projects to, 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 to be certified on. Um, so those colleague resource groups uh, really help support um, Pfizer colleagues. And they're, they're open to everyone, you know, you don't have to just be black person to be part of the GBC or Asian to be part of the Asian uh, Alliance. You know, I'm, I'm a part of pretty much all of our, as uh, I'm part of our leadership team for the GBC. So I essentially go to, to all the CRG meetings, whether it's women's group or our, um, our LBGT, uh, our open uh, Pfizer employee network. Um, so I, so really those, those groups uh, help support our, our, our colleagues. So that's one thing we have in place and, um, I'm pretty sure every major company has that. So, so yeah, definitely take advantage of those. That's great. All right. Um, we have just um, a couple of minutes left and it looks like we, um, we have one question that has come in on the chat. Many people enter general biology saying, I wanna be hands-on in the lab. 
how do you find direction to have more of these niche roles that maybe um, you don't always hear about? So I think that's that's a great question. And, you know, Ashley, I, I immediately come to you and, and to you, Lionel, because you're not necessarily working, you know, standing at the bench with white lab coats on pipetting. Um, but you, you kind of started in that realm. And so how did you find out about these different opportunities that exist that are not necessarily those hands-on lab roles? That's a great question. Um, I honestly lucked out a little bit. I, I had those connections and they were hiring and they reached out and they said they thought of me for that position. But my advice would be um, if you know a major um, laboratory or biomed company in your area, there's a lot in Connecticut uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. But what I would say is go to their website and just look at the roles that are offered. Look at what they're hiring for that's not necessarily in the lab. And then Google what the role is and see, hey, you know what, does that look like something I could do? Um, you know, I never even associated quality assurance with laboratory work. They felt so different in, in my <laughs> when I was an undergrad, um, but they, they can't be. They work so closely together and one supports the other. Um, so yeah, my advice would just be go to somewhere that you would feel comfortable working that has a really good reputation and just see what positions are available. And it will also open up doors for you to move around within that company. If you don't love the role that you've got, it makes it that much easier to kind of transition into something else once you've got your foot in the door. Yeah. Lionel, do you want to add anything? Yeah. I mean, I, I think Ashley said it best, <laughs> really going online and, and search, 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 you know, um, if, it, if you're not looking for a lab based role, uh, and you're trying to narrow it down. I mean, you can look for project management roles, um, QA based roles, um, strategy roles. Uh, but really, yeah, it's going to those websites and just and just searching, and then getting on LinkedIn as well. Um, like we talked about, that's huge. There's a ton of recruiters on there, a uh, ton of resources on there. Uh, so yeah, fantastic. Well, this has been great, and the our time together has just flown by and I think we probably could talk on and on for hours here, but we, <laughs> we've simply run out of time. I just want to take um, one final moment to thank uh, Vicki, Ashley, Lionel, and Amber so much for, for being here this afternoon and sharing your experiences. I think your stories are all really inspirational and I think you're great um, role models for all of our current undergraduates that are, that are on the call uh, for this event today. So thank you so much for your generosity with your time and uh, Look forward to seeing you all on LinkedIn and at some other um, at some other networking events. So thank you all very much. And I'm going to turn things back over to uh, uh, Dr. Christine Broadbridge. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Wojcicki and the panelists. Your input is so valuable. What a wonderful contribution to round out our program. It's been a terrific day, and I cannot think of a better way to cap things off. It is now my privilege to introduce Lieutenant Governor Susan Beisowitz. The Bioscience Career Forum has long enjoyed the support of our governor and lieutenant governor who've worked tirelessly to grow business and expand workforce opportunities for our students. We are thrilled that Lieutenant Governor has been able to take some time out of her incredibly busy schedule to join us here today. Susan Beisowitz is serving as her first term as Connecticut's 109th Lieutenant Governor. As I mentioned, she and Governor Led Namont Ned Lamont have been very supportive of workforce and in fact have made it a top priority. We at Southern are delighted with the state's investments in education over the past several years, particularly in the area of bioscience. Prior to being elected to Lieutenant Governor, Attorney Bysowitz served as Secretary of State from 1999 to 2011. As Secretary of State, she helped thousands of businesses grow registered thousands of voters, cut bureaucratic red tape, honored veterans, and fought to keep elections fair. From 1993 to 1999, she served as a state representative in the Connecticut General Assembly, representing the towns of Middletown, Middlefield, and Durham, and all of her public roles. And as an attorney and private practice, she's always understood the importance of helping businesses expand and prosper, and in preparing students for jobs and for those businesses. And that's where we're about today. So again, thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. 
Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I really appreciate you having me today. It's such an exciting program, and I'm thrilled to contribute to the discussion. Such a pleasure for me to visit you here at Southern to talk about the work that Governor Lamont and I are doing in two of my very favorite areas, which, it, which are STEM education and diverse representation in STEM fields. When Governor Lamont and I first came into office, um, one of our first orders of business was to create the Council on Women and Girls, which I chair along with um, members from our constitutional offices, all of our commissioners and our state legislature. Our vision was to coordinate efforts across the state to address issues that impact women, girls, and their families. And we understand that part of this charge is being intentional about identifying and overcoming unique barriers for women and girls of color. And with that in mind, um, the council has four subcommittees. One of them is economic opportunity and workforce equity. Another is education and STEAM. We add the A for arts. And I'm really proud of the work that we've been able to do through the council, um, especially when we've been working through this global pandemic. Uh, specific to STEM advancement, we know that learning more about STEM at a young age gives students the opportunity to become more familiar with fields that are not only growing, which, but which are also expanding and evolving constantly. We also know that allowing students to explore their interests in uh, these areas allows them to think about a future in the STEM workforce. And so one of the things that we've done is to have um, the Lieutenant Governor's Computing Challenge for students in Connecticut grades three through 12. We're on our third year. And we spearheaded this because we really wanted to uh, make sure that our students had a really good basis in STEM fields, but also we wanted to give opportunities to our community organizations and businesses to partner along with us and to encourage them to help us uh, get more diverse participation in, the, in these fields. Um, our theme for this year is Coding for Good, Inspiring Health and Wellness for All. And Jackson Labs has created a new award this year to promote participation from students in opportunity districts, uh, which represent our 10 lowest performing school districts in the state. So through the Jackson Labs Urban Achievement Awards, thank you so much, Jackson Labs, um, individuals or teams at the elementary, middle and high school levels will get cash prizes um, in, in the prototype and development challenge categories that we have for, for our coding contest. Um, building off the scoring criteria, we're gonna give additional weight to projects that have a bioscience, public health, or medical innovation uh, focus. Last year's challenge uh, garnered more than 430 submissions from 70 different schools and 30 informal education partners. We can never have any uh, have enough participation. So uh, I hope that uh, you can encourage folks that you know uh, to be involved. Um, we're going to be receiving submissions through April 29th. Um, one of the other things I do, in addition to chairing the Governor's Council on Women and Girls, is to chair the Interagency Council for Ending the Achievement Gap. Uh, which was created by statute to address disparities in academic performance by our youth. And some of the things that we know um, are these, that academic performance is directly impacted by life circumstances, such as housing, food, and financial insecurity, multi-language learning, and access to resources. 
So one of the obstacles that was particularly highlighted during the pandemic was the digital divide. Um, we knew it was really important for remote learning to be an accessible option for all of our students and work to make sure that children in our most vulnerable populations had laptop and internet access. Our work in this area is ongoing um, and our next meeting uh, is June 7th and we'll be featuring presentations about the use of technology in teaching and learning uh, and some of our plans to close the digital divide. Um, we also um, have a program with our State Department of Education uh, and we call it Computer Science for Connecticut known as CS for CT. And our steering committee has stakeholders from state government, industry and business, higher education, and our K through 12 education partners. And the purpose is really to connect education and workforce needs um, to operationalize a statewide computer science plan, uh, which was adopted by the State Board of Education in June of 2020. And our plan includes a variety of goals around broadening participation in computer science to include people in underrepresented fields, such as women, students of color, multi-language learners, and special education students. So I'm excited to share that high school students are gonna have a unique opportunity to, to develop more focused skills in the area of STEM, for which they have a greatest interest and at the moment, graduation credentials require a specific number of credits in math or science. But starting with next year's graduating class in 2023, they'll have the option of completing nine STEM credits overall instead of a more particular breakdown. So they'll have more opportunities to create a more integrated coursework for collaborations with community groups and employers and for students to develop more unique skill sets. The governor and I also have another um, number of post-secondary opportunities in the works. One is the Capital Area Tech Partnership. Um, it's the first regional sector partnership um, intended to create new career pathways for thousands of good paying jobs in IT, advanced manufacturing and other industries in our state. And the partnership consists of over 50 technology companies with common workforce needs that will work together to articulate career pathways and to collaborate with training providers to create programs aligned with those pathways. And those training programs are gonna offer skills-based training uh, leading to entry-level employment in IT cloud services, data management, and cyber security. Um, one of the things that I've been really focused on is how we can get uh, our uh, young women and students of color seeing themselves in STEM fields. So one of the other things I do is serve as honorary chair of the Connecticut chapter of Million Women Mentors that encourages women and girls to pursue, persist, and succeed in STEM fields. We believe in the power of mentoring to help women and people of color navigate fields in which they're currently underrepresented. So I'm so, so proud of our active and robust Connecticut chapter that has worked to highlight this throughout our state. We have an amazing state leader, Carolyn Alessi, uh, who is uh, helping uh, to work with our private sector leaders, community organizations, healthcare companies, and state employees. And their hard work and dedication earned us the 2021 State of the States Award for Million Women Mentors at the national level. Um, so we're very, very proud of that. And in December, our Council on Women and Girls had a panel discussion with Million Women Mentors featuring a diverse group of women leading in the field of information technology. And we had Southern Connecticut State University Professor Winnie Yu 
as one of our panelists in our discussion, highlighted the importance of advancing both gender and racial diversity in STEM fields. Um, earlier this month, a Million Women Mentors held our annual uh, Stand Up for STEM Awards, recognizing youth, adults, and companies that have been instrumental in STEM mentor mentorship in our state. So I couldn't be more grateful for um, our work and our work with Million Women Mentors uh, in Connecticut in their support for our women and girls. So we always welcome more involvement. So if you have any interest in joining this incredible movement, feel free to contact our office and we'll put you in touch with our steering committee. Um, so the final thing that I'll talk about is um, encouraging our business employers to learn about Paradigm for Parity or P for P which is a private sector initiative um, in which companies plan, pledge to attain gender parity in their leadership roles by 2030. P4P recently expanded its vision and mission to focus on not just on having more women join their corporate boards and their corporate leadership, but also to be more intentional about racial equity alongside gender parity. Uh, and since the governor and I came into office, we've been happy to recognize Connecticut-based companies, as well as other companies with a large state presence that have signed the P4P pledge. Uh, our first announcement in 2020 announced four pre-existing signatories and six new pledges. And as part of our 2021 mentoring month, we recognized Otis Elevator, Avon Gravit, and Hubble and earlier in March, um, we announced Trinity Hartford Healthcare, uh, Yale New Haven Health System, Jackson Labs, and Pfizer as joining this amazing uh, group of P4P companies. So as you can see, advancing STEM education uh, and careers in Connecticut is one of our top priorities. Um, it's also a way to close the pay gap between men and women, uh, because unfortunately only 25% of the STEM jobs are held by women and we need to do more uh, to achieve parity in the STEM fields and by doing so achieve pay equity. So just wanna say thank you so much for having me today and happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Excellent. And I just cannot thank you enough. Those remarks were perfect. And to say that, you know, I've been in Connecticut for over 20 years and just to see, you know, a passion of mine is about STEM and more women in STEM and just overall celebrating that. And also really celebrating the wonderful companies that we have in our state and promoting innovation. And I just want to applaud the work that you're doing. Um, I am checking for questions in the chat, but one, th one question I have is that we've spent a lot of time today talking about the value of professional networking. And in fact, our students, they heard from the panels and then they actually practiced. So I was wondering if you, Lieutenant Governor, could talk a little bit about your, you know, your experiences with networking and how it might've impacted you over the years. Oh my goodness. Well, um, networking is key to professional success. Uh, no matter what your field. Um, and I love that you are focusing on helping uh, university students do that before they go out into the work world. Uh, because I can say then during my college experience, no one really focused on that. And I think it's really, really important. Um, and I'll say, uh, just uh, for our own office. We have um, internship programs every semester. So we've had some great students um, from your school and from public and private universities and community colleges across our state. And we've actually hired um, students who are interns to do, uh, to work full time in our office and they've been really amazing. So I think that kind of shows uh, the power of networking. Um, and 
what I would do is encourage your students um, to go to job fairs. For instance, I just attended one at the University of Connecticut um, and it was held at Gampel Pavilion. And there were um, an array of companies looking for engineers, computer scientists, IT folks. There were a number of companies that were recruiting for internships and summer work. So I would say to your undergrads, take advantage of those career fairs and the opportunities you are in a field where there is huge demand and not enough people to fill the demand. And I will say, and I'm glad to be looking at these female faces because you are even in more demand because I think uh, those STEM companies realize how important it is to bring different perspectives to the table and they want to hire competent, smart women. So do take advantage of those. There are networking opportunities uh, right on campus. Also think about people that you know who work in STEM fields, ask them to take you on a tour, uh, see if they have summer internships, um, see if you can shadow people. And the final thing I'll say, because this is really important, um, in order to be it, you got to see it. So be part of the Connecticut William um, Million Women Mentors chapter. Um, you will see diverse uh, women who have succeeded at the very highest levels. Um, and they... Um, will be your mentors. I mean, they will share their experiences. They will help you. So that's the other bit of advice. Take advantage of everything that you see right around your campus. Think about friends and family that might be involved in fields that are of interest and join Million Women Mentors because um, they can be invaluable and they'll provide you with amazing women who have succeeded already in fields that you aspire to be part of. Outstanding. And again, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us. Just a wonderful way to end just a great day, a very, very productive day. So thank you. So with that, we're on to our closing um, and we are going to um, first of all, I just want to thank all of the participants, panelists, you know, for taking the time and for, again, I know I've said this a number of times, but congratulations to the students uh, that took the time to be here and those of you that went through the session that we had on networking. Um, so another thing I really want to stress is that we want to really share the excitement that we have, right, about the great work that's going on in the state of Connecticut. We're extremely proud of the, our state and really just, you know, an important thing for us to talk about is just the diversity of perspectives and how important that really is for something that we talked about today and that is innovation and how important innovation is. All of you are playing a really important role by being here today and we're excited to see you contribute towards the future. So you're all wondering when is she gonna get to it, right? You're waiting to hear who those winners are going to be. So again, what are the, what are we going? What do we got here? Um, a, a special, I called it a VIP, right? I don't know how many people, right? VIP tour um, to Jackson Labs, and um, Dr. Wojcicki has joined me here, um, and and so thank you for arranging that. This is amazing of to course, be able absolutely. to provide that opportunity, and then um, and then we've got our biopath fleeces. So we have our winners. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and announce those names. So these are our three our three um, individuals for the VIP tours and networking sessions. Um, so Sophia Dragata, Dragati, and I hear some excitement and some applause in the background. Carly Grimord, Grimord, and I apologize in advance for my pronunciations. Leslie Miller. So those are the three individuals. So congratulations. Um, and, and we also have some additional uh, folks that we're going to acknowledge. Um, and so those that we're additionally giving t-shirts to are Renee Dunbar, 
Alina Wheeler, Alibaf Valenzuela, Valenzuela, and Nicole Lavello. So we have your email addresses, but um, so again, congratulations to those individuals. Uh, and with that, I just said, you know, some quick closing remarks. And um, so, so thank you again, and to the students um, at this event, you learned about best practices and you were also provided the opportunity to practice those. So we encourage you to commit to practicing for the long term. I mean, that's what this is really about. Today was a start for some of you. Uh, and it was also a start that was in a virtual format, which has its own kind of unique challenges. So as Lieutenant Governor said, you know, there are a lot of opportunities around you for to continue this work, to continue to practice. And I would say that um, the comment also about, you know, considering your own closest network being your family, not a bad idea, but also consider faculty like myself, ready. We are here to help you. Um, I want to provide a special thank you to our guests, um, Lieutenant Governor um, Michael Piscatelli, Representative Yaccarino, Christine Cohen, as well as the planning committee. Um, I just have to say, we get started early. Um, a lot of detail was put into putting together this program, and I just feel privileged to be able to work with individuals that really deeply care about the goal for this Jackson Labs um, and Biopath um, Forum. Uh, Sarah, would you like to, to add any words as we make our closing? Yeah, just no, just to reiterate and echo some of your comments, Christine, that, you know, to the students out there, please continue to participate in these types of opportunities, continue to build your networks, build upon the skills that you that you heard about to, in today's uh, in today's sessions. I hope you had the opportunity to make some connections with representatives from uh, companies across the state. Use those uh, LinkedIn skills, make those connections. And um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to people to learn more about opportunities that might be available. And as Christine said, you know, we're all here to support you. We all want to um, to see you succeed, and we look forward to seeing what uh, this next generation of uh, STEM professionals is going to bring to the the bioscience bioscience industry in the state of Connecticut. So, thank you so much for being here, and um, it's been a real pleasure to once again be part of the organizing committee for for putting together this important event. So, don't forget in the next two days, get those LinkedIn's done. Right, remember those slides. The follow up in the next few days. I'm looking forward to connecting with you. And, um, and Biopath is ready to hear from you if we can help out at all. So with that, I close for the day and looking forward to seeing you in person very soon. Take care. Bye everybody. Bye bye. Jackson Laboratory's genomic education team welcomes a wide range of learners, from undergraduates to physicians. Our learners engage in online courses, in-person programs, and mentored research experiences. Programs focus on complex genetics, as well as functional, clinical, and translational genomics, covering basic research, 
to clinical genomics. Offerings include bioinformatics, cancer, genomics, and medical genetics. Genomic education is guided by a goal to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion from participant recruitment to culturally competent teaching and inclusive mentorship. Our program is grounded in evidence-based research from science education and adult learning fields. Our programs meet the needs of our diverse learners. Online courses provide real-time access to high-quality scientific and clinical content. For early career scientists, we offer research experiences in world-class research labs. Courses at JAX provide cutting-edge content and foster collaboration with scientists around the world. We develop 21st century leaders in biomedicine through career and leadership development opportunities. What are you looking for? A place to go. A place to grow. A place to explore. A place to be more. A place with a view. That's somewhere new. A connection. A cause. A challenge. Maybe it's a sense of community. A space for unity. A place to belong. A place to be strong. Maybe you're looking for... A starring role. Or a role to watch. A place where your voice matters. We're changing course. Or exploring your passion. Even if it's different than what you imagined. Never means starting over. Maybe it's a new way of seeing yourself. Or someone else. Here, or somewhere you never expected. Maybe you're looking for your spot on the team. Your biggest dream. Or maybe you just need to get started. With a direction. A discipline. A degree. Your best opportunities are here. Where we meet you. Whatever you're looking for. You'll find it at Southern. Expect more. Be more. Southern. Southern.